after the first two Assassin's Creed games, I started to treat this franchise as a source of repeatable, decent fun with high production value. Following Assassin's Creed 2, the next games were very similar in terms of gameplay, adding some minor changes as well as new stories and historical eras. Black Flag could be an exception to the rule. Let's be real, it was more of a game about pirates than a compelling story about assassins. Assassin's Creed Origins made a pivot in the game design. Ubisoft put more emphasis on open world activities and introduced a decent amount of RPG mechanics. AC Odyssey follows the path spearheaded by Origins and builds on its solid foundations. The question I had in my mind when I started the game was if Ubisoft haven't overextended their only ambition with this title, which was to make everything bigger. You see, I like to play games when they are years after release in their most complete state. Fully patched with all DLCs, then analyze the hell out of them. With this approach, it's impossible to stay away from some spoilers. So, I already knew that many critics felt like the game is too big, bloated and sometimes boring. Now it's time for me to talk about 2018's entry to the franchise. Odyssey is a really weird beast to evaluate. It upgrades systems and mechanics used in Origins, yet I feel like I wasted a lot of time while playing this game. This is a feeling that I almost never had in any other AC release. So, if you are interested in my opinion and analysis, then let me introduce you to the late review Assassin's Creed Odyssey. This review is based on 157 hours spent in game. Completing the whole game, both paid DLCs and all free DLC content on hard difficulty as Alexios. On my playthrough, I have also explored the whole map. No question mark was left unchecked. I made sure to complete every side quest available. I'm not counting the repeatable stuff like bounties, contracts, etc. Although I completed some of them. On my journey I have fully upgraded my character and the ship. I have started a separate playthrough as Cassandra in order to check if there are any differences in the story from Alexios's point of view. I managed to acquire 100% achievement completion for the game. I have finished every previous Mine Assassin's Creed release and I will be using some of them as references. Also, I have already made the late review about Assassin's Creed Origins. I talked about my history with the previous games in the franchise, so if you are interested, link to that video is in the description. So, it's time to take a leap of faith and explore ancient Greece. The main story takes place during Peloponnesian War, around 431 BCE. The majestic lands and azure open seas of ancient Greece are torn apart by the conflict between Sparta and the Delian League under the leadership of Athens. This is a setting with a lot of potential. Ancient Greece is a birthplace of democracy and a home to the greatest philosophers that ever lived, people like Socrates or Aristophanes, great politicians like Pericles. The great Greek city-states were known for their rich culture, art, architecture and religion. So, it's a no-brainer that Ubisoft wanted to take players on a journey through mythical lands of Southern Balkan Peninsula. The plot revolves around a young mercenary, so-called Eagle Bearer, bound to an eagle companion, Icarus. Odyssey gives players a choice whether they want to play as Alexios or Cassandra, siblings coming from a proud bloodline of Leonidas. This choice is mainly cosmetic, as the story stays pretty much the same no matter which one of the two players chooses to become an eagle bearer. 
If we choose to follow Alexios' story and make him an eagle bearer, then it's revealed that Cassandra died in a tragic event which kicks in the whole personal story of our protagonist. If Cassandra is chosen as player's character, then the same thing happens to little Alexios. In my playthrough I've chosen to play as Alexios, so I'm going to refer to him as the protagonist. This time, the theme of revenge, so prevalent in other titles of the franchise, is put in the second place. Family, our character's legacy and bloodline are the main motifs behind most of Alexios' actions. Our protagonist starts the game as an outcast, former Spartan boy sentenced to death for opposing local laws, trying to save his sister yet in vain. Sparta considered him dead, yet he survived and was raised by local crafty entrepreneur. Alexios spent his early life training to become a mystios, a mercenary. This is the exact moment when players get to start their adventure with him, or Cassandra if they choose her. The first hours of gameplay spent on an island of Cephalonia serve as an introduction into the game mechanics. Ubisoft introduces some characters, shows the basics of exploration, questing and tries to sell players on the idea that our choices matter. A notion worth exploring later in the video. Odyssey uses this modern way of over-explaining even the simplest aspects of its gameplay in the early stages. To a seasoned player it might be frustrating. Not far long into their own Odyssey, players acquire their own ship, which allows them to continue their journey through the southern Balkan Peninsula and the islands surrounding it. On his way to find lost family, Alexios meets various historical figures like Socrates or Pericles. He also dives headfirst into the culture and mythos of ancient Greece. Who are you? Ask anyone and they'll tell you Socrates. His legacy and heritage do not go unnoticed. The cult of Cosmos, a newly introduced shadowy organization, spreads their influence across the war-torn lands, infiltrating both sides of conflict for their political gain. The cult is used as the main antagonist in the story in the exact same vein as Templars or the Orders of the Ancients were used before. So it's not very innovative. The members of the cult take personal interest in our protagonist's bloodline, posing a direct threat not only to him, but also to remaining members of his family. This is also the part where story elements are integrated with the gameplay mechanics. Players unlock a cult tab where they can spy on the general structure of the organization. Each major member needs to be discovered first. Information about some of them can be found through exploration, doing side content or killing other cultists. The most important skimmers are hidden behind the veil of main story quests. Still, hunting cultists is pretty fun and there is a good incentive in doing so, as killing each one of them awards players with a legendary weapon or part of an armor set. Laila Hassan returns as the modern day protagonist. This time she is a fully fledged member of Assassin's Brotherhood. So I guess I was granted my wish. When I played Origins, I speculated that sticking with Layla and developing her story might finally create an engaging, cohesive modern day storyline. You know, a Desmond 2.0. Unfortunately, writers don't do a lot with her character. Bah! In the base game we rarely even see her. There is only one meaningful development involving Layla, and then the bulk of her story progresses in the Fate of Atlantis DLC, and some of the writing choices are questionable at best. I will elaborate more on the topic later in the spoiler section, but let me give you an example first. In Fate of Atlantis, Layla is ambushed by a full squad of highly trained Abstergo soldiers, and they come at her with only batons. No firearms, not even a taser, it's just laughably bad. So, after witnessing modern storyline in AC Odyssey, I really wonder if Ubisoft writers are even capable of making anything halfway decent with it. It turns into a really bad soap opera. And I guess we all know why. Money. Assassin's Creed once had a modern day plot with a beginning and an end. It was Desmond's story. Right now they desperately want to keep it going, but they don't know where the narrative is heading. I bet executives just want to keep it going forever to keep milking the franchise. 
That's the reason why in each new installment we have this unsatisfactory modern day plot where barely anything happens. It becomes really tiring, even for me. But let's go back to Eagle Bearer's story. Now, the game's time period might raise some eyebrows. It happens about 300 years before Assassin's Creed Origins. Bayek's story portrayed the troubled beginnings of Assassin's Brotherhood, formerly known as the Hidden Ones. So what business do we have in ancient Greece long before Bayek's times? I can see that the setting is incredibly enticing and I guess that Ubisoft saw that too. So they decided to dive deeper within Animus database and dug up ancestors even more distant than Bayek himself. Alexios and Cassandra are still the ancestors to Lila and the Assassin's Brotherhood, but I feel like they are used as an excuse by the writers to place the action during Peloponnesian Wars. Throughout the whole base game, we won't even see the Hidden Blade, a distinctive Assassin's tool, characteristic to the franchise. Not only that, Odyssey leans more into direction of fantasy, including a lot of supernatural skills. Hell, during the leveling process players are able to unlock a skill which completely nullifies fall damage, even from the highest peaks. There is a skill allowing you to become invisible. Eagle Bearer is able to shoot ghost arrows flying through walls. I know that it could be explained by the heritage of the protagonist, but at the same time it seriously hurts immersion. And don't get me wrong, I know that Assassin's Creed was never a realistic franchise. It always engaged with the idea of some supernatural artifacts left by the precursor race. Sure, even Origins so generously praised by me pushed the fantasy elements more than any other title in the franchise. But in Odyssey, it really starts to sink into the core of the experience, which I actually do not appreciate. I liked when the franchise focused more on exploring historical events with a slight breeze of supernatural themes and threats. Right now it kinda feels like another open world generic fantasy setting. I might be alone on this one, but that's how I feel. I should probably not climb on this. Though I feel like slapping an Assassin's Creed title upon this game was done purely to increase potential sales, there are decent advantages to it. First of all, it gives us an opportunity to explore Greece not only from the historical standpoint, but also, since there is more emphasis being put on fantasy elements, it opens a way to play with Greek mythology. Some of the greatest ancient myths are introduced as a twisted remnants from the precursors, the Isu. Thus, player might be able to meet eye to eye with Cyclops or maybe even a Minotaur. The strings Liseos used to navigate the labyrinth. Let's see what's at the end. I must admit, I was reluctant towards this idea of using mythological creatures in Odyssey, as I felt that it further diminishes historical accuracy of the story. Ubisoft cleverly uses the established lore around the Isu civilization, you know, the precursors. So beings like Minotaur are represented as a vile experiment, a guardians of the powerful Isu artifacts. I consider it to be a satisfying way of incorporating Greek mythology into AC lore and at the same time gaining the most of it story-wise and gameplay-wise. The plot unfortunately failed to captivate me as strongly as the main narrative of AC Origins. Bayek's story presented believable main characters with strong personality traits and motivations. It was a tale about broken family, passionate lovers totally consumed by desire for executing vengeance upon their son's killers, the Order of the Ancients. Both Bayek and Aya realized that avenging their son was not the end of their epic journey. It was actually just the start. And while still crazy in love, they had to sacrifice their personal happiness in order to pursue higher goals. A beautiful, heartbreaking story. Assassin's Creed Odyssey main narrative doesn't land anywhere close to the same level of emotional involvement from players. The story starts strong, offering personal, emotional stakes for the main character. 
yet soon it gets lost in a vast space offered by the game's huge world. You see, map is massive and we are free to explore it. In the same vein as it happens in Skyrim or Witcher 3, players are able to leave the main plot for tens of hours before getting back to it. But Witcher 3 had a cast of memorable characters and a very strong lead in the form of Geralt of Rivia. So even if players strolled away from the main narrative for a longer period of time, they were still invested in the story. In Odyssey, the long breaks when we are away from the main narrative actually feel like they are weakening its impact. Especially since Ubisoft forces players to grind experience points as some zones are level gated, which effectively interrupts the progression flow for people who only wish to explore the main story. As a completionist, I explored various lands on my own accord, so level gating was not a problem for me. Various side quests can offer interesting stories to follow. I especially got emotionally wrecked when I met a young girl who asked me to bring her more clay. It turns out that she was an orphan and her parents told her to make friends which she understood literally. So she made clay statues. It's already pretty sad, but the player is given two choices. Be harsh towards her, scold her for creating statues and tell her to find real people to play with. Or be comforting and compliment her. I didn't want to be harsh, so I chose the second option, only to later come back and see her crying as the rain came and destroyed her friends. If I would choose the rough option, then the next time I would see the girl, she would have played with other kids. The main story also has some really strong moments, there are even some emotional ones. Still, overarching narrative felt mildly interesting at best. What do you want with him? We fought together. A friend? Yes, and a friend of Sparta. Now take me to him. One of the main factors determining whether players are going to immerse themselves within the story are the main characters, especially the lead. Odyssey is the first game which gives players options during conversations. It's not only a story in which we participate, but we can actively influence the outcome of some events, decide the fate of other characters. So pretty standard RPG stuff, right? The thing is that up to this point the narrative was set in stone and characters were defined by their actions during cutscenes. This way it's easier for the writers to flesh out the personality of the protagonist. Their words and actions show the audience who the person is, shows their values, quirks and traits. In most RPGs developers use one of the two main ways of telling a story through the main character. First way, a blank slate. The character is completely made by the player. The conversation options usually give player more choice in expressing themselves. This character is designed to be the true avatar for the player in the game's world. It's interesting that this way, usually players do not perceive their character as someone with whom they can sympathize, because the character was designed to be literally them but they pay more attention towards other characters and they build relations with them. Then there is the second method, role playing as an existing character. An excellent example here would be Geralt of Rivia in the Witcher games. Geralt already has his own personality and traits. He is this grumpy monster slaying veteran, a man of few words, dedicated to his cause, yet bent on making hard moral choices. Players can sympathize not only with the side characters, but also with Geralt himself, as he is very well defined by the story. Still, the plethora of the choices players make feel impactful, but all of them take into account Geralt's disposition and character. Ok, so we are all on the same page here, right? Alexios definitely falls closer to the second method of building character. But let me ask you a question. What are his personality traits? This is a question I asked myself for a long time while trying to write the script for this review. It's not like Alexios is a badly written character. He has some decent personality trait. He's confident, dedicated, very focused on his goals. Alexios is shown to be caring towards people closest to him. It manifests through his interactions with Phoebe. You're coming, are you? If you're going, I'm going. Phoebe, you're not old enough. I can't look after you all the time. I can look after myself. I don't need anyone to help me. Even if that were true, 
It's not your time. But there wouldn't be any trouble. Promise. He is also shown to be eager for a fight. Well, as a very skilled mercenary, why wouldn't he be? Of course, he's brave and adventurous, as without those two traits, the whole story couldn't happen. On some occasions, he can show a little bit goofiness, but in general, I perceive him as a more of a serious character. A very good soldier, material, or even a commander or general, he can easily get to that strict, confident state. But he isn't very convincing when we start to analyze his more intimate persona. For me, the more down-to-earth Alexios feels very bland, without any defining characteristics. You see, this is exactly where Ubisoft's writers try to give players chance to shape his personality. A lot of conversation options let us decide whether Alexios appears as more of a modest person or a self-absorbed narcissistic prick. If it's training you want, we don't just take anyone. Do I look like I need training? I was sent we can make him a religious believer or someone siding with the power of common folk rather than gods. Players can decide if our mistress will care only about money or if he will show more affection towards others. So writers choose to create our protagonist as a mix of imposed personality traits with a room for player agency. It's a great choice, but because the everyday Alexis is so bland, it was hard for me to immerse myself fully with his story. If it was a 30 hour story, I would call Alexis as a forgettable character. But as I spent around 150 hours on my Alexis playthrough, naturally he kinda grew on me. But you know, it was a forced relationship. A great deal of people who played Assassin's Creed Odyssey referred to Cassandra as the better protagonist. I played as her for a couple of hours in order to see any differences in the story and Eagle Bearer's character. I have to admit, the narrative feels like it was created for Cassandra more than Alexios. Her story, while pretty much the same, feels better. Much of the credit has to go towards her voice actress, Melisanti Mahut. Not to say that Alexios' voice actor, Michael Antonakos, did a bad job. Not at all. Both characters have this immense presence, but Cassandra feels more charismatic because she got one more very natural trait. Warmth. She feels more convincing. This is a good time to tell you that halfway through my adventure as Alexios, I discovered that Cassandra is canonically the eagle bearer. It actually devalued my enjoyment from the story. I expected that the great Ubisoft storytellers will refer to Odyssey's hero as simple as the eagle bearer, since they give players a choice. But no, it's specified directly that Cassandra is the eagle bearer. And poof! Just like that, I felt like my whole playthrough was merely a fan fiction. Yes, sure, Cassandra's playthrough is pretty much the same, so I know how it would go. But if Ubisoft informed me during character selection that Cassandra is the canonical choice, then I would have picked her. I know that this seems to be petty, but I can't help it. There is a reason why Follow New Vegas protagonist was referred to as the Courier. Why Dark Souls lore talks about Chosen Undead or why Skyrim had Duvakin. It leads to another topic. Ubisoft is inexperienced with giving player choices. The conversations are usually binary, offering only two ways of responding to someone. In most cases, Alexis can present two opposite attitudes. There is nothing in between. So, when someone greets Alexis as the mighty godlike eagle bearer, a legend, Alexis can respond by being smug and assuming his godlikeness, or by being humble and responding with simple I'm just a mystias. Most narrative dilemmas are also divided into two possible outcomes. Those can affect the future of the main storyline, but they won't have any significant meaning outside of it. So, as for modern RPG standards, it's a decent way of conducting a story with branching narratives. Okay. But I expected more out of a AAA title with a big budget behind it. This is narrative branching in a good RPG. This is Assassin's Creed Odyssey. The cool thing is that sometimes an NPC can acknowledge that you have done some other tasks before, or that you skipped some major event. Ah, here you are, and not a moment too soon. The Cyclops is more important than a boyer. We need to talk. Precisely what I was thinking. Let's hope Drusilla has a good sense of humor. Well? Odyssey offers players a lot of potential romance partners, some of which can even join our crew at Adrestia. 
Usually, each of those NPCs has some sort of a quest chain before you can interact with them in a more intimate manner. What I didn't like is that the game offers no follow-ups, no consequences of forming a relationship with a person. As soon as the quest chain ends or an NPC joins our crew, the relationship ends. So after romancing a couple of characters, I ended up with a ship full of my lovers and there wasn't any follow-up. It felt like I was sailing with my own harem. And it's bothersome, especially since some of the cutscenes assume that there is a possibility for a more serious relationship between the person and Alexios. So again, Ubisoft gives us choices, but with no consequences. I'll see you at my ship? Yes. I'm ready to go wherever the sea wind takes us. Wherever it is, adventure awaits. For both of us now. There is even a possibility to acquire a crew member who catches Barnabas' attention. You'd think that there will be some kind of romance between those characters. Is this route explored? Of course not! Alexios! You know Iola! The same can be said about hunting the cult of Cosmos. You could say that after wiping half of the cult's leaders, the organization should probably acknowledge Eagle Bearer as a serious threat. Yet, their stance never changes. They still play with Alexios instead of just trying to murder him when they have a possibility. Again, no consequences. The cardinal example of failed RPG design when it comes to choices appears in the first DLC, Legacy of the First Blade. There is a very important point in the story where Eagle Bearer is forming a relationship with a person and there is no choice given to the players. It's forced in order for the rest of the plot to happen. It also connects the story of Odyssey with the general plot of the franchise. This game was widely marketed as a choice-driven adventure. Players were supposed to forge their own legend and with the first DLC the choice was taken away from them. There was a big outcry from fans as some of them felt like they were betrayed by the plot. Writers tried to appease these granted players by adding some new voice lines to the game, but the dialogue was just bad and the narrative didn't change at all. So it poses a question, was it really beneficial to go this route of giving player choice? When most important things still happen no matter the choice and it cheapens the experience? A question worthy of Socrates. I remember that in my AC Origins late review, I didn't like how side characters were treated. Usually they showed up at some point in main story, then we could do one or two side quests for them and that was it. Then they all showed up again close to the end of the game, which for me was about 50 hours after I met some of them. Origins expected you to remember those people. Odyssey gives the crucial side characters more side quests and more appearances during the storyline. Thanks to it, writers are able to flesh out those personas and create a bond between them and the player. Barnabas and Herodotus are our main companions. They work really well as a duo. Herodotus is a historian, a man seeking truth in every aspect of life. Barnabas is an experienced naval captain. He acts as this friendly uncle guiding our characters towards adventures. He's also a very religious person. He believes in Greek gods and myths. Both Herodotus and Barnabas push the eagle bearer forward as the old captain catches every bit of gossip heard around Balkan Peninsula and the historian tries to uncover every mystery related to Isu artifacts. Their involvement in the story feels natural and enhances the experience, a very good move made by the writing team. Can't you just feel the presence of Zeus and Ira when you stand here? I thought it was the wind. Don't mock the gods! While side characters in the game are definitely more memorable, I feel like they are a little bit uneven in terms of writing. On one hand you have Herodotus and Barnabas, but on the other there is Socrates and Alcibiades. And well, I have some problems with those two men. Socrates is a great historical figure, one of the most famous philosophers. Philosophy has such a wide and varied set of general features that it would be really hard for me to nail it down to a single definition especially since I haven't studied it. 
but let's agree that the most general term explaining philosophy could be that it deals with the search for knowledge, wisdom surrounding every aspect of our life, love, ethics, moral dilemmas, culture and civilization. And the most common way for philosophers to interact with the essence of the world was through asking questions. Ubisoft writers took that one to heart. Odyssey's Socrates is a man who constantly asks questions, proposes a different dilemmas in front of the player. These are greater than those of the man you helped ostracize. Still, you raise a fine point. Who is more responsible? Anaxagoras for getting himself mixed up in this? Or you, for simply sealing his fate? I'm not responsible for his actions. I have one thing to think about, my own. Then I hope you also think about today, about Anaxagoras, about choice. I know it's deliberate. Writers try to encourage players to think about their decisions, to kinda invite them into becoming philosophers for a second. It's a neat trick. The problem is that Socrates speaks only through questions and convoluted dilemmas. It becomes tiring really fast. Writing team knew it. As I said, I believe it's done like that on purpose, since even Alexios starts to mention how weird or tiring those conversations become. I think that Ubisoft tried too hard with Socrates and they focused only on his philosophy-related background. I even started to perceive him as a fraud. A man so desperate for everyone to acknowledge him as a great philosopher, so he keeps tormenting people with his silly dilemmas, asking questions, never giving a decided answer, waiting for other people to come up with a satisfying explanation. I actually did some reading on Socrates, so thank you Ubisoft, you actually made me smarter by forcing me to read. This man was able to produce not only some silly questions, but also some interesting thoughts and quotes. Then. There is the character of Alcibiades, clearly created to be some sort of a comedic relief. All his scenes and dialogues revolve around pleasure. Alcibiades is an explicit hedonist and almost every line he speaks in game has double meaning or sometimes doesn't even leave a room for speculation. He also has this weird mannerism which quickly becomes tiring. Alcibiades can make every word feel dirty. It's like his addiction to pleasure is his only defining trait. You've talked enough for the both of us. We must find another use for that mouth of yours. Speak to him long enough and you may find the smallest hint of knowledge veiled deep behind his uh, enthusiastic advances. <laughs> I have to give Ubisoft credit where it's due. If you continue to run errands for Alcibiades and do all of his personal side quests, then there is a narrative payoff waiting for you. It turns out that the Greek hedonist is not as one-dimensional as you could have thought. He is revealed to be a ruthless strategist and politician, trying to marry his way into position of power. It's a great addition which saved this character in my eyes. Sidequests can be split into two categories. Regular, fully fleshed and well-developed side stories, usually marked with a golden exclamation mark. Some of those missions can create a long side storylines encompassing various characters, introducing a smaller scale events which could hold players' interest to the same extent as the main narrative. Then there is the second group, repeatable, more generic tasks given as a never-ending source of additional content. There are multiple white or silver quest markers appearing on the map. Those mark the start of a smaller task, like clearing bandit cap or fetching a lost heirloom from a place not so far away. What's cool is that all of the voice lines are recorded so player can feel like they are on another meaningful adventure while in reality it's actually more of a filler content. In each bigger city there is a notice board offering mercenary work, various contracts and bounties. Most of those tasks are timed but offer valuable resources and higher amounts of gold. It's another source of irrepeatable content, so players who really love Assassin's Creed Odyssey won't be left without nothing to do. Players like me, who enjoy exploration before attempting to do any quests in the area, will quickly find out that on many occasions the game acknowledges that we have cleared a place which will be the goal of the potential mission. Numerous times when I decided to accept a quest, it turned out that I already had fulfilled its requirements. 
Whether it was obtaining a specific item or killing certain person, the game acknowledged my previous ventures and didn't force me into redoing them. It's a really good design choice. It does not apply to every mission, since there are tasks which force players to revisit certain areas, but on the other hand, there is a lot of missions which could be completed before talking with the quest giver. If you get it for us, we'll take what we need to get out and you can keep the rest. It's not this necklace, is it? I found it in the ruins of Krani. That's it? That's Prokris' necklace. We can finally leave. No more vegetables. <sighs> we'll have a new life. One far from our past. Ubisoft also gave players chance to create their own custom quests in the mission editor. So if you encounter a blue portal marked on a map with a blue exclamation mark, that signalizes a user-generated content. And you know, this kind of content usually varies in quality, so if you feel like it, you can give it a chance. There is a bug preventing some of those missions to launch, so players might have problems with attending every quest. This addition is definitely commendable and interesting. It gives a chance for some great user-generated content, which is a big plus. It also gives players more reasons to stick with the game a little bit longer. We are entering a spoiler section right now. If you want to discover the plot of the game on your own, use timestamps to skip this part. I'm gonna go through the narrative of the game experienced by the eagle bearer Alexios. I'll describe the events and voice my opinions. Spartans! Every breath that you have taken has led you to this moment. Every drop of blood, sweat, and tear, all of it has led to where you stand right now. Odyssey starts with this short section set during the battle at Thermopylae, where 300 Spartans led by Leonidas clashed against the mighty Persian army. It's a climatic introduction to the grand adventure waiting ahead of us. Moving fast forward in time, players meet the protagonist of the story, the Eagle Bearer. As I said, in my case it was Alexis, but canonically it should be Cassandra. The Eagle Bearer is a well-trained mercenary, a Mystios, known by the locals because of his fascinating bond with his eagle, Icarus. Alexios lives on Cephalonia. In the early stages of the plot, we will meet Marcos, the merchant who took care of Alexios when he got washed ashore as a child. How it came to this? Well, throughout the first hour spent in game, Alexios will experience a series of flashbacks which reveal his tragic childhood. Got you! <laughs> Again! Up! Yes, Spartan rises as soon as they have Alexis was born in Sparta and was training with his father to become a soldier like any other Spartans. It is revealed that Alexis had a younger sister, Cassandra, and you could say that the family was happy. Remember that. You will bring this family to glory. Tragedy struck when the oracle at the sanctuary of Delphi prophesied that young Cassandra will bring the fall of Sparta in the future. In order to prevent this, Cassandra was to be sacrificed at Mount Tagetes. The child must fall first. You can't let this happen. Please, she'll do no harm. She'll help us. She will lead us. Silence! <sighs> Nicolas! 
Nikolaus, look at me! Look at me, Nikolaus! Don't! Don't listen! Your blood is tainted! Rid yourself of this poison! Butter! For Sparta! This is a strong opening. I must say, it establishes Alexos' past and his motivations towards his future family. It also gives players enough background in order to make conscious decisions in the future. Back to Kefalonia. Alexios lives a life of a mercenary. His closest family now are Marcos and Phoebe, an orphan. It turns out that Marcos, through his entrepreneurship, enraged local warlord called as the Cyclops. So, the trio has to come up with the plan to weaken Cyclops' forces. While clearing one of his camps, Alexios meets a man named Elpinor. He offers a mercenary job to our hero, a task of killing the wolf of Sparta, a prominent leader of Spartan forces. Alexios accepts the deal, but you can already say that this Elpinor guy seems shady. Anyway, in order to even try to complete the new task, Alexios needs to figure out how to leave Kefalonia. The opportunity presents itself when Cyclops finally arrives on a great ship. Eagleberger decides to face the man, but firstly mocks the giant. Say that word! Did he say Cyclops? Did it hurt your feelings? I don't like it when people call me that! Um, oh, I didn't. I... But you're so fat. I mean, big, strong. You really do only have one eye. May I? Give it to me. Give it to me and I won't kill Marcos for having you steal it. Give it to me! You want it? <laughs> Go get it. As the dust from the battle settles, Alexios realizes that by killing Cyclops, he also saved Barnabas, the former captain of Adrestia, ship which now belongs to our Mystios. Barnabas pledges to sail with Alexios as he owes his life to him. Now with ship and crew, Alexios can finally leave Kefalonia and set sail to Megaris, a war-torn zone where the wolf of Sparta fights against Athenian army. Megaris, Alexios realizes that Wolf of Sparta is his father, Nikolaos, the man who threw him to death. Overcome with anger, he wants to find answers but is stopped by Stentor, Nikolaos' second in command. Stentor turns out to be Nikolaos' adopted son, trained to be a great leader. In order to finally be able to meet his father, Alexios decides to help Stentor in weakening Athenian grasp on Megaris. But your skills are better serving us than our enemies. This is a great and natural introduction to the whole uh, zone conquest mechanic. After winning the conquest battle and landing Megaris under Spartan influence, Eaglebearer's wish is granted. He meets with the wolf of Sparta. So you are the champion who won us today. Tell me your name, hero, so that I may greet you as a true warrior. Nikolaos quickly realizes who Alexios truly is. He uncovers the truth that Alexios is not his biological son and that he needs to find Merini, his mother. I loved you and your sister as if you were truly my own. But you were never mine. What do you mean? That is a question. You should ask your mother. Wait. Find your mother. Find her. Wherever Marini is, 
She knows far more than I do. Here, player faces the first major decision. Kill Nikolaos or let him live. In my case, Alexios decides to show mercy. Nikolaos runs into banishment as he is ashamed of his decisions. This is a choice which will have consequences in the future. Upon hearing the newest revelations, Barnabas proposes to seek guidance and meet with Oracle. Eagle Bearer is reluctant to this idea at first, but finally agrees. It's the Oracle who sentenced Alexios' sister Cassandra to death. Before meeting with Oracle, Alexios visits Elpinor. Back to business. You know where to meet Elpinor, I suppose? His home is in Pilgrim's Landing. Ah, oh, Mistyos. How was Megaris? Mercenary shows Nikolaos' helmet, which greatly pleases Elpinor. He reveals that he wants Alexis to hunt down the rest of his family. Eagle Bearer obviously objects and fights against Elpinor goons. Using the chaos to his advantage, Elpinor escapes. So disappointing. Alexis heads to Oracle of Delphi. Before he makes an attempt of meeting her, he meets Herodotus. Historian recognizes Alexos' spear as the legendary spear held by Leonidas during the battle at Thermopylae. You see, Alexios' mother presented him with the spear of her father, Leonidas, as an heirloom, and now he uses it to perform assassinations. I lost my mother when I was young. I have to find her. Where is she? It's you! From the visions! The child on the mountain. How could you know that? You need to leave. Now. Leave? Do you have any idea what I've been through to get here? Oh, but I do. While in Kausos, you didn't cower in the face of the priest. A child and her family still live thanks to you. But how? No one can hide from the light. Please. I've come this far. You must have the answers I seek. Child of the mountain. The cult of Cosmos have eyes everywhere. They will kill you. Cult of Cosmos? The Oracle has spoken! Alexis isn't able to get any decent answers from the Oracle, but she reveals that she knows about him and mentions Cult of Cosmos, an organization which she is deeply terrified of. Unable to get his answers, Alexios decides to sneak into Oracle's home and confront her. Enough with your lies. Tell me what I want to know. I can't breathe. If you raise your voice, if you tell a lie, I will cut your throat. There he learns that she is being controlled by the cult for a long time. So the blame for the destruction of Alexa's family is directly placed on the cult. Oracle conveniently uncovers that Elpinor is one of the cult members. She tells Alexios that their hideout is beneath Temple of Apollo. Alexios tracks Elpinor. The man reveals before death that Colt wanted Alexios dead, but he saw an opportunity to use the mercenary in his own schemes. Eagle Bearer finds the Colt uniform and a small Isu artifact. With those two items, he is able to get inside Colt's hideout, disguised as a member. You're late! Very late! It's a good thing Vimos hasn't arrived yet. Sorry, it's my... Uh, first time. A new recruit? <gasps> Welcome! Wait. Alexios is able to have a chat with unsuspecting cultists. They speak of a mighty warrior, Vimos. But the cult only wants to use Demos to achieve their goals and then dispose of her. They even scheme to capture Demos' mother. We need them, all of them. To use them? That information is not for Demos, of course. You know how volatile she is. She could rip through us easily. I'll be sure to... It's apparent that Cult of Cosmos is just using this person. But they are so afraid, scared of Demos, and it becomes apparent when she shows up. Elpinor is dead. One of you is a traitor. Do 
The artifact will expose them. You! Everyone will be tested. You first. Go. You. Alexios learns that the most the cult's powerful weapon is in fact his sister, Cassandra. As she covers for him by killing random cult member, he sneaks out. Now, let's talk about Demos' portrayal in the game. Upon entering the hideout, Demos is shown to be angry, frustrated and prone to violence. It's understandable as she just discovered a riot hiding within the cult. But this behavior stays with Demos throughout the entire game. And I know, she is this way because she was pretty much raised to be hateful machine of total destruction. Okay, but I feel like being angry, brutal and prone to heinous deeds are her only personality traits. Outside of being a skilled warrior, of course. Interesting note here. I found out that Demos Alexios sell his brutality and anger issues in a more believable manner than Cassandra's Demos. It's not to bash Cassandra, as she is a fine antagonist, but I just feel like it's a role created specifically for Alexios. So it's cool that Ubisoft gave players this choice whether they want to play as male or female Eagle Bearer, but I'm confident that canonical Cassandra storyline is better. Much better. Anyways, after the encounter with Demos, Herodotus persuades Alexios to go to Athens. On the way, the historian recognizes Leonidas' spear as an Isu artifact. He reminisces that he has seen similar Isu symbols painted near the cave on Andros Island. So, that's where they sell first. On Andros, Alexios discovers the cave with strange symbols. He uses the spear to gain entrance. Inside we can take a look at an impressive use of visuals as a single light beam directs players towards a weird mechanism. A mechanism which turns out to be an Isu machinery with the power to gradually restore spear to its full power. Each member of the cult has a piece of Isu artifact with them. All those triangle pieces can be used to upgrade our spear, giving player another reason to hunt down cultists. On his way out, Alexios meets Demos. Cassandra is being rude and unapologetic. There is an obvious great amount of anger boiling within her. She warns Alexios to step away and reveals a ploy to kill Athenian leader, Pericles. Now when the goal of reaching Pericles in time is clearer than ever, Alexios travels to Athens. The city is impressive, with great attention to details. Not only that, Athens are huge. Finding Pericles though is not that hard. We must come together now for the glory of Athens! Glory for you! <laughs> friends! Friends! Please! We can see Pericles arguing with other Athenian politician, Cleon. Alexios is quite naive, but most players probably already see that Cleon belongs to the cult. For God's sake, he even uses the same colors as the cult henchmen. But let's play them. 
Pericles invites Eagle Bearer to his symposium. It's pretty much a party associating every prominent Athenian figures, politicians, thinkers and philosophers. Upon reaching that place, Alexius runs into Phoebe. She serves as Pasia now. Phoebe! You promised we'd see each other again, and now we have. I also said stay out of trouble. Which I have. Okay, almost out of trouble. The event presents an opportunity to meet interesting famous people, run some errands for them, and thanks to it, maybe finally learn about Alexios' mother's whereabouts. During the party runtime, Alexios interacts with Aristophanes, Socrates, Pericles, Aspasia, and Alcibiades. Someone's being hurt. Open this door, or I'll kick it in! Oh, 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 don't mind her. She likes to watch. Symposium leaves Eagle Bearer with three trials regarding Mirin's whereabouts. First one leads Alexis to Corinthia, where he meets Anthusa and other Hetera. Girls have a problem with the monger, a huge brute who belongs to the cult of Cosmos. In order to find the monger, Eagle Bearer has to help various people in Corinthia. One mission leads him to a warehouse, where he's supposed to destroy monger's supplies. It is there where he meets the Spartan named Brasidas, in one of the most badass cutscenes in the game. I feel like I should mention that Alexius could deal with gang members himself, but I'll let it slide. Prasidas also wants to get rid of the monger. There is a choice given to player. Either side with Antusa, lure the monger to theater and execute him for every citizen to watch, or side with Prasidas and assassinate the brute quietly. I decided to make a spectacle out of it and publicly kill the man. This way, player learns that the monger was set by the cult to kill Merini, but he couldn't accomplish his task. Then Antusa tells Alexios that Merini sailed away on a ship called Siren Song. So, that's the first clue. The second trial leads to Hippocrates. He remembers a Spartan woman with dying child who came to him. Yet, at that time he was too young unexperienced and couldn't help them. He sent them to the sanctuary of Asclepius, so naturally that's where Alexus is going. But there is something weird about that place. Everyone is trying to get rid of Eagleborough. People are unnaturally silent and very secretive. So Alexus starts an investigation of his own. He discovers that his mother was in fact looking for help at that place. Merini was deceived and was told that little Cassandra died, while in reality the child was taken by the cult. Many times before that witch stole his voice. He tried to save the baby, did everything he could. I don't believe you. Dead. How can my baby be dead? I don't know what to tell you. You were lucky she survived as long as she did. That, that fall was devastating. My baby! My baby! <laughs> Listen, there's nothing we can do for you anymore. You best be on your way. Ray is here. <laughs> They're gone. They're both gone. 
Alexios appeared just in time to face Chrysis, the woman responsible for abducting and torturing young Cassandra. Don't you dare speak of my family, snake! I still remember the night your mother brought me my child. The sad, pathetic thing, crying in the rain. Had I known then that Mirini had two children. But here you are. Even though Chrysis manages to run away, she soon tries to set the trap for Alexios, only to die there with her cult soldiers. Another clue gets uncovered. Cassandra was stolen by the cult and Merini doesn't even know that both of her children are alive. The last trail leads to Xenia, a fierce pirate leader. Alexios makes a deal with her, so she reveals that Merini served under her banner as pirate known by the name Phoenix. I seen her since I was a child. So, you're on a quest to find your family? Something like that. Then your path is not an easy one. The information I need, how long will it take? I already have it. You do? Your Merini now sails under the name of Finikas. She started as a member of my crew, but we parted ways not too long ago. I'm leaving soon. Chaos is your home. But this isn't my true calling, my purpose. You might never find what you're looking for, Finikas. I can't stop until I do. You are a great pirate. And you are an even greater friend. Don't forget me. With all the clues gathered, Alexis heads back to Athens to meet with Aspasia and plan the next steps in finding Mirini. Unfortunately, it turns out that the city is damned by the plague. People are dying on the streets and the situation is dire. Alexios discovers that even Pericles fell sick. Aspasia sends Phoebe and Alexios on different missions. Eagle Bearer needs to find medicine for Pericles. Once he returns, it turns out that Phoebe is nowhere to be found. So Mystios goes on a search. This was savage. Done to send a message. Mother of all, I greet you. Phoebe's death is one of a few emotional scenes that actually connected with me. Her character is persistent enough through the story to make her feel significant. Soon Hippocrates and Socrates show up. Pericles went missing. They suspect that he went to Parthenon, as he wanted to commune with the gods before death. Alexius rushes to Parthenon only to find Demos killing Pericles. Pericles. With Pericles dead, the city has fallen to the cold. Alexius has to run with Aspasia. They reach Adrestia and sail away. Hippocrates and Socrates stay behind to care for people still living inside city walls. Grieving, Alexius confronts Aspasia. They manage to come to agreement and after analyzing the clues they head to Naxos Island as they believe that's the place where Merini resides. After arriving to Naxos, Alexus heads to meet with the leader of the region. He discovers that he finally found his mother. If Paros is sending them, I want to know the moment they make landfall. Yes, Archon. But Archon, please, Zestis. the merchants have... I understand your concerns. But protecting the town and the quarries is what's most important. You may all go.
The meeting is over. Alexios! How? But I closed my eyes, I could still see you fall. I thought I had lost you. Cassandra is still alive. There is something magical in those scenes when, after spending countless hours searching for someone in vast game's world, you finally manage to reach your goal. The scene with Mirini and Alexios is emotional. Finding her is a reward of its own. I would hesitate to compare it to Geralt finding Ciri, as that scene was even greater. Still, the reconciliation of Eaglebearer and his mother is a highlight of the story. Alexios reveals that Cassandra is still alive. Now the family can try to exact revenge upon Cult of Cosmos. First, they need to deal with pirate wars between Naxos and Paros Islands. With Alexios' help, Merini is able to conquer Paros and defeat its leader. This part of main story also cements Eaglebearer's mother as capable commander. So with Naxos' safety secured, the two can finally visit Sparta and reclaim their home. But before doing that, Merini tells Alexios to sail to the island of Thera and find his real father. Something you should do first. What? You need to find your father. Thera is a ruined volcanic island. There's a simple mirror puzzle which unlocks an issue gate. I think I've got it. There. That should work. It turns out that underneath Thera lays an ancient Isu complex, a complex which is a gateway to the lost city of Atlantis. There, Eagle Bearer meets his father. Icarus! Traitor! Greetings, Alexios. Welcome to Atlantis. Atlantis? Impossible. I thought it was just a myth. There are many secrets in this world that are hidden behind myth and legend. And who are you? My name is Pythagoras. I'm your father. Pythagoras? That doesn't make any sense. He died decades ago. Pythagoras explains that he used the staff of Hermes to prolong his life in order to guard secrets of Atlantis. But the greater knowledge is hidden behind four mechanisms, all of them related to the mythical beasts, Minotaur, Cyclops, Sphinx and the Medusa. Vera, we found Atlantis! Atlantis? At this time, Lila takes a break from the animals and decides to search for the cavern. She manages to get to the exact same place where she left Alexios' memories, so in order to discover more information about the place, she heads back to the animals. So, Alexios has to find the creatures. It is possible to complete each side story related to a mythical beast before this quest, but let's quickly go through them. Minotaur can be found under Nosos Palace in Masara. Alexios finds a young boy there. The brave and resourceful child wants to search for his father who went inside the palace in order to find Minotaur but never returned. There is a series of quests to finish in order to get a key to the gate under the palace. Once Alexios finally obtains it, he delves deep inside the ruins under the location. The visuals are impressive, the atmosphere thick. Alexios manages to find Boy's father. Unfortunately, he is dead. This must be Nikios. A ring? Ardos might want this. Finally, Eaglebearer manages to find Minotaur. The fight is disappointing, as the beast does not do a lot of damage so Alexios manages to overcome it pretty easily. <laughs> so 
Sphinx trial leads Eagle Bearer to Beotia. He needs to find a couple of artifacts in order to assemble a complete statue. Then he needs to approach ruins at the top of a hill during night time. A light beam shows the place where Alexis has to put the statue. Challenger. I Sphinx is not a boss fight. Beast asks a riddle. Player has to press the right symbols in the correct order. As the Sphinx dies, Alexos acquires another part of the Atlantis Gateway mechanism. The next trial leads to a man who claims himself to be a god. Eagle Bearer frees the god from captivity and then runs a couple of errands for him. After that, the man invites Alexios to the Forgotten Isle. You see? They're here! The, the gods are behind this door! Listen! I didn't mean to be. The man who claims to be God is excited to show Alexios another God and rushes into the cave. Creators of the universe! Outstretch your mighty hands and raise me to the The God turns out to be Cyclops. This is quite a good fight. The longer it goes, the more hectic the environment becomes, with a lot of falling debris at the end of the fight. After defeating Cyclops, Alexios collects its part of the machinery. This leaves Eagle Bearer with the last beast on the list. He ventures far northeast to the island called Lesbos. Alexios meets a woman who claims that her lover was taken away by the monster. As I said before, I do not appreciate how much the series has leaned into the fantasy grant, but let's be honest, this gives developers an opportunity to flex their creative muscles and offer players this visually distinctive, mysterious, maybe even scary zone called Petrified Forest. Unfortunately, the gate is locked, which means that Alexios again has to run some errands for locals in order to unlock the passage. After opening the gate, it's time to face the Medusa. The fight is okay, I guess. As I was already heavily specialized in using bows, it quickly became tedious and boring, but the boss has a decent set of attacks. It's just that the petrification mechanic forces players to hide behind pillars, which makes the fight to last for an extensive period of time. With Medusa being defeated, Alexis collects the last piece of machinery. Short note here. I have to commend Ubisoft for making each of the mythical beasts side quests into short stories of their own. They all have a decent amount of quests attached to them. They require some groundwork, especially the Minotaur. The whole region of Mesara revolves around the beast, whether it's in direct relation to the monster or just by mentioning it. So, Alexis heads back to Pythagoras. He places each part of the machinery on the stilis. After each reclaimed artifact, a short message from an Isu construct place. The being is called Alithia, and as more messages are unlocked, she explains that the complex awaited for Alexius. A human being capable of gathering the knowledge needed to unlock the power of staff of Eremis. With that, it's uncovered that Pythagoras' part in the story has to end. So Pythagoras hands the staff to his son and dies for it's already prolonged his life far too long. Humanity's fate will be decided by the choices you make. I understand. Alexios, 
Choose wisely. The story shifts to Lila. She needs to resolve a light beam puzzle in order to progress further within her discovery. All of the sudden, Alexios shows up. Exists. Knowing that you know nothing. A good friend told me that once. Possible. Alexios. Yes. I used to be called the Eagle Bearer, but Icaros is long gone. I've been searching for you. But you can't. It's... <laughs> you weren't really looking for me, were you? It works! The Isu artifact, the staff of Hermes Trismegistus! Pythagoras was right. You are the key to the prophecy. You will restore the balance, Leila. I have fought in too many wars. I have seen... Too many people die. I've traveled from one end of the earth to the other. This belongs to you now. Promise me one thing. Anything. When you are done, destroy it. Destroy them all. So now Leila is the holder of the Staff of Hermes. This event concludes the main story part called as the Legacy Questline, at least until the second DLC. This is the only substantial plot development bearing any meaning towards the great narrative of Assassin's Creed. Think about it. At this point, we don't know if Eagle Bearer has any direct connections to Assassin's Brotherhood. We only know that he's a distant ancestor, but he does not even use a hidden blade. He doesn't even have to be an assassin, he can be a warrior or an archer. Cult of Cosmos is in no way officially connected to Templars, so that staff given to Leila by Alexios or canonically Cassandra is the only part of the plot which actually has any meaning. Of course a lot of the lore around both Eagle Bearer and the staff is going to be explored in the DLCs, but the base game does a really poor job in establishing the meaning of its events towards the greater narrative. And you know, not everyone is going to play DLCs, so getting an important part of the story behind additional paywalls is risky to say the least. Additional note, modern day Alexis died on me around midway through the whole game, it's very anticlimactic. Future events lose a lot of their potential weight because of that decision. I'm not expecting Ancient Alexios to die midway during his adventures, but he could maybe choose to sacrifice himself in some crazy event, which would be the climax to the story. This way, if Alexios gets captured by the cult, or if he even hands his weapons to his enemies, I know that he will be fine because I saw him live till the modern day. I just wonder why the scene of handing the staff of Hermes isn't pushed to be the late game closure for both Alexios and Lila. Instead we have this weird out of place death. And to be honest there is a possibility that some players might actually experience this event as the last thing in game. As Ubisoft gives players freedom in choosing whether they go for mythic beast hunting or just follow Mirini to Sparta. But still, the greater freedom in choosing which main storylines players want to follow ends up in hurting reception of the grand narrative of Odyssey. Lamb, you made it. I trust the seas were favorable? Poseidon might be the only one not trying to kill me. 
And did you go to Thera? Did you find him? I did. What did he Alexius arrives at the village called Githion. He joins his mother and they both relieve some of their past memories. Then they head to their former house only to discover that it was taken from them by the Spartan kings. Brasidas informs them that they need to earn back the right to their property directly from the kings. So Alexius and Merini had to meet up with the kings. After the meeting, the storyline branches out into three separate storylines. Alexis has to support the Spartan war effort in Boeotia, then there is the case of helping out in the Olympics, and the last thing is an investigation. One of the kings is a cult member. Alexis has to figure out which one. Let's start with the Spartan War in Boeotia. As I hunted for Sphinx artifacts in that region, I got it all covered. It turns out that the Spartan polemarch responsible for conquering Boeotia is Stentor, the adopted son of Nicolaos. He attacks Alexios as he believes that mercenary killed Nicolaos back in Megaris. Unfortunately for him, both men have to work together, as Alexios is on a mission for kings of Sparta. Stentor gives Eagle Bearer a list of four Athenian champions which have to be killed. As Mystios approaches the last target on his list, he discovers that the champion had already been killed by Nicolaos. Here, the choice from the past is going to matter. Alexios returns to Stentor with mission completed. Sparta battles Athens over Boeotia and wins. Yet Stentor, overtaken with rage and grief, challenges Eagle Bearer to a duel. Nicolaos stops Stentor. In Arcadia, Merine and Brasidas are looking for clues of which king of Sparta is a member of the cult. There are news of a strong cult lieutenant in the region, Lagos the Archon. Another consequence of previous choices comes into play. Merini wants cultists dead. But Brasidas asks Eagle Bearer not to kill Lagos as he was a good man. In fact, that's true. The man is blackmailed and his family is taken hostage. But as I did everything to leave the leverage the cult of Cosmos had on Lagos, he still insisted on attacking Alexios. The only way to prevent Lagos' death was to side with Brasidas long before when player was choosing how to deal with the monger in Corinthia. If player would silently dispose of the monger, then the choice to spare Lagos would be available now. And this is kinda weird writing choice. It doesn't make sense, as player is still able to save Lagos' family from the cult, which should open some way to negotiate with Lagos, but unfortunately it doesn't work. Anyways, disposing of Archon in Arcadia gives Merini and Alexios clue that King Pausanias is part of the cult. The last request from the kings is to get Spartan champion to the Olympics. Testicles is a typical bulky brute with low intellect. Just as his name suggests, he is used as a comic relief. Alexios takes Testicles on board Adrestia and they set sail to Elise. <laughs> I need to be oiled before I go to the games. Well, I would have been happy to assist if you were in any state to compete. I... He likes to be royal. Well, that's obvious. Yeah. You know us. Oh. Come here. Gives us a hug. <laughs> Surely he can swim. Well, looks like you're the champion now. I can't believe he's gone. Unprecedented. After Testicles' demise, it's up to Alexios to represent Sparta and become the champion. Eagle Bearer prepares for tournament and then fights against various contestants. The 
gods have looked kindly on these, our champions. But there can only be one winner. Sparta! Yours is eternal glory. As an Olympic champion, Alexius heads back to Laconia. Take back our family's land. Of course. But my purpose here is to bring down the cultist king. You make your mother proud. Mother and son enter the throne room. Your proof is right there. You know he's guilty. This isn't proof of anything. Ephos should only be called upon for serious matters. This lack of evidence is a waste of our time and disrespectful to the thrones of Sparta. The accuser should be made an example of for all other reckless fools. Alexios and Marini of Agiad. Your names are cursed. May the Cryptia hunt you and the Elote scrape the meat from your bones. Agreed. A wise ruling. Too bad you don't have a mask or a black cloak to save you this time. You're there? In their feet? <laughs> After Pausanias reveals himself to be the cultist, Alexius quickly rushes to kill the man. Conveniently, Pausanias held a letter side by him revealing cult's plans regarding Sparta. Eagle Bearer shows the letter to King Archidamos. Yes, I found proof he was a member of the cult of Cosmos. Undeniable proof. This letter was written and signed by Pausanias' own hand. Outlining the progress of their plans. Alexios and Mirini head back to their home. Soon, Rasidas comes to inform that Themos is in Pelos, reign in war, killing Spartans. The next day, Eagle Bearer joins Spartan forces in battle. In the chaotic combat landscape, Alexios sees as Brasidas tries to take on Themos, but gets wounded. And it is one you cannot win. If Rosidas dies, his blood is on your hands. His blood and every one of your friends. Are you mad? We can still stop. Enough! We will not stop. I don't want to kill you, Cassandra, but I will stop you. My name is Nemo. Demos boss fight is constructed quite well. It contains clearly telegraphed abilities, some interesting environmental attacks and visible opportunities for dealing some damage. If we continue, one of us will die. Isn't that the point? I found matter. Finally reunited, only to lose each other again! After combat, Alexios wakes up in prison. The shocking revelation dawns on him. Cleon was cultist all along. Who would have thought? Anyways, in a display of true silly Hollywood-like writing attempt, Alexios is saved not by a group of soldiers, but by an old ship captain and a fat philosopher. Let that sink in. One of the most valuable prisoners is being rescued by people who shouldn't even be able to get near armed guards. Interesting. Death may be the greatest of human blessings after all. Alexios meets up in Pericles residence with Aristophanes, Socrates, Barnabas, Herodotus, Alcibiades and Hippocrates. The group comes up with a plan to free Athens of Cleon's reign. First, they will need to dig up some dirt on him. Then there is a ploy to undermine Cleon's competences. Aristophanes prepares this great play for people of Athens to show them the true face of Cleon. Before their plan can come to fruition, Alexios is informed that Prasidas recovered and is preparing for a battle against Cleon's forces in Macedonia. I heard about Pilos. Are you all right? I've been through worse. We have bigger problems right now. After Pilos, what happened? The remaining Spartans found me and gave me time to recover. So I did. 
But your leg. You disappeared from battle. I was captured. Prasidas feels like Eagle Bearer betrayed him. He could use Amistos' help during the battle though, so the two prepare to fight against Athenians. Cleon tries to get rid of Demos as Cassandra becomes unpredictable and too hard to control. It angers Eaglebearer who chases Cleon. You turned her against us, my own sister. We lifted Demos up. We made her great, unstoppable. You made her a monster. You're not worth the memory. Now, when Cassandra's body is nowhere to be found, Alexios decides to meet with Mirini at Mount Tagetos. The place that destroyed their family and gave a start to Eagle Bearer's Odyssey. Mount Tagetos is a symbol for the story. This place gave us the dramatic beginnings of the story and now it will present us with the dramatic end. But it's the player who will choose how the journey concludes. On the edge of the world, a mother calls out to her child. Touching. Cassandra, please! You use that name as if it means something to me. It's the name your father and I gave you. Was that before or after you brought me to this mountain to die? It was the cult. I tried to save you. I did everything. The priests told me you were dead. And they told me you abandoned your daughter. Cassandra, come to me. We are your family. We can go home. Family? Home? <laughs> Even in a world of beasts, a family Protect its young! I loved you! I still love you. The one you love is dead. And my destiny is clear. I won't let you get in my way. Cassandra, listen to me. You're my sister. I tried to protect you once, and I failed. I won't fail again.
I chose to reason with Cassandra, but I didn't expect such a weak reconciliation. The touch of the spear is all it took to convince Cassandra that she was in the wrong her whole life. She was ready to kill both Alexius and Mirini seconds ago, and now she cries and is ready to rebuild the family bonds? Ok, I know that by touching the spear the whole truth was flashed before her eyes just as Alexios experienced it before. But if you would have been raised in certain belief, would one magic trick be enough to convince you? I think it should be more of a start of a long journey of rebuilding the relationship through work and understanding. But maybe I'm expecting too much. And then the music plays. I remember being like, no 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 no, you did not deserve to create this emotional happy ending. This is trash. Alexius, wait. Thank you. Later we can visit the homestead. There is a scene which is the culmination of player choices. It should be this narrative reward for your previous decisions. So, I guess I achieved the best ending. Everyone is alive and happy, such a fine family. And then Cassandra and Stentor start this wrestling match and everyone is like, oh, those kids. You know that they are adults, right? Maybe it would work a little bit better with Demos Alexios. You know, two testosterone bros trying to measure their dicks without using a ruler. What are you doing, step bro? It's safe to say that I didn't like the ending of the story. I know what writers at Ubisoft were going for. It's supposed to be this wholesome conclusion to a lengthy epic odyssey. It's designed to be the reward for players for all their decisions. As I haven't connected strongly with the story, it felt unearned, cheesy and lacked impact. And let me remind you, this is my review, my opinion. You can disagree and that's totally fine, but I'm giving my thoughts here and well i'm going to be honest with you if you don't agree with me then tell me in the comments i encourage any form of constructive criticism and discussion as the personal journey for alexios has been concluded the only unfinished storyline revolves around cult of cosmos defeating demos and other minifigures within the structure reveals that aspasia is the cult's leader well it was a surprise for me bam Expectations subverted. So, Alexius heads to Cult's hideout in Fokis to deal with the organization once and for all. Alexios, it was never supposed to be like this. Decades ago, a group of people gathered together to uphold a theory which they believed could control the universe that the world functioned in equal parts, order and disorder. But some fell lovingly into the wicked arms of chaos, and the cult of Cosmos was born. They abused their power, casting the Greek world into eternal war, one you were created to stop. In destroying the cult, you have done what I could not. You are a hero, but this imbalance comes with a price, my child. For without chaos, there is supreme order, a loss of progression and freedom. But there is still hope. Hope in you, hope in the future you will bring. We must fix the mistakes of the past. Use the staff. Repair the rift in the universe. The world depends on you, Alexios. You need to be the hero again. So, you've seen it too then. It's beautiful. 
isn't it? What are you doing here? You killed the last member of the cult. Well, just about. What? It's true. I was their leader. But only for a moment, it seemed. When your sister came along, it changed everything we were aiming for. You made me optimistic that you could help me bring down the cult that had become so corrupt. And you did, albeit unknowingly. So, what happens now? We shift focus. We steer towards a new Republic under one supreme rule. A dream I'll make reality. But it is still a dream. One that isn't realistic. Abandon what you know and just imagine. Forget democracy. No more blue and red. Just citizens working for a greater good. This is crazy. It won't work, Aspasia. It didn't work. It's not crazy. It's enlightened. Once people in Athens get wind of this, they'll come to know they've wanted it all along. Even you. Uh, I'm not sure. You've spent your whole life thinking for yourself. Let go. What I plan will require you to trust me. Come with me. This future's not a dream. You should go. Lead your new republic. I won't be the leader. We need someone with the knowledge of a philosopher and the wisdom of a king. That's a tall order these days. I couldn't have done this without you, Alexios. You're doing the right thing. I always try to do what's right. Then we're after the same thing. Alexios, there is much left to do now. Storm. Assassin's Creed Odyssey has three main threads when it comes to storylines. Odyssey focuses on personal journey of Eagle Bearer. It meanders around his family and inherently tells a story about uniting the broken bonds. Legacy talks about Alexios' bloodline, about his purpose within the universe of Assassin's Creed. The last thread is devoted to the enemy, called of Cosmos. It focuses on destroying this vicious organization. I appreciate the story. It's decent, but it lacks the element of making it personal and meaningful to the player. I found it hard to connect with Alexios. It probably would be much easier if I would play as Cassandra. Still, Ubisoft gave players choice, so it's more on them than it is on the player. After the main storyline there are two DLCs expanding Eagle Bearer's story. They also flesh out Laila Hassan as a character. The legacy of the first blade starts as Alexios heads to the region of Macedonia, where he encounters the Persian rebel Darius, who uses the first ever hidden blade. Who are you? Turns out that Nima, the girl who asked Alexios to come to Macedonia in the first place, is Darius' daughter. She went behind her father's back in order to get the legendary Eagle Bearer to help them. It turns out Darius is responsible for assassinating King Xerxes, and now is on the run from the Order of the Ancients, an organization which players already know from Assassin's Creed Origins. Order of the Ancients plays a similar gameplay role in the expansion to what Cult of Cosmos did in the base game. We are given a list of targets to kill. Alexios slowly chops his way to reach the so-called Huntsman, a vile man committing atrocities throughout the whole Macedonia in order to draw out Darius. I have to say that the sub-story of Huntsman is really intriguing. Ubisoft does an impressive job on the spectacle when it comes to the cutscenes here. 
the huntsman tries to get Alexius to doubt himself through cruelty. Eagle Bearer realizes that on his own journey he took countless lives. He is as guilty of being a monster as Huntsman is. Come on, this is good writing. Writers finally gave us some thought-provoking story. As the Huntsman falls, he reveals that Darius's true name is Artabanus. He was not only behind the assassination of Xerxes, but he also planned to kill King's successor, Artaxerxes. Both Artabanus and his companion Amorges worked with the Order of the Ancients, but they didn't agree on account of killing Artaxerxes. Artabanus, Darius, was painted as a traitor. His family were killed and Nima is the only one that managed to survive. Now Darius and Nima are on the run. They decide to leave Greece as it's clear that the Order already knows of their presence. It turns out that escape is not going to be easy. Darius and Nima plan to sail away from Ahaya, but the Order is already there. Their regional lieutenant, known as the Tempest, controls ports and set up a naval blockade. Once again, it falls to Alexius to help Nima and her father. At the same time, he helps various refugees who also wish to leave Greece. The second episode of the DLC focuses heavily on building a relationship between Eaglebearer and Darius' child. All of that pretty much happens with player having little to say on the matter. What I really liked in the story is Clea's contribution. She starts as this concerned citizen hiding Alexios. Later she reveals that she is Tempest's mother. She is resentful about her parenting ways and suspects that she pushed her daughter too hard which turned her into the Order. Eaglebearer finally manages to confront the Tempest and defeat her. After that, Darius and Nima are free to leave. Player is given a choice, plead Nima to stay or let her leave. Real connections with people are rare. We shouldn't be too quick to let them go. Stay, please. Whatever the choice will be, Nima and her father are going to stay and it will later be uncovered that they settle in Ahaya. Alexios and Nima have a child named Elpidios. For me, this story was perfect as I pleaded Nima to stay and I was on board with this family making direction but there is a problem hidden here, a source of greater controversy. You see, Odyssey was marketed as a game which gave player choice. You could play your eagle bearer as a gay character, for example, and now all of a sudden player is forced to a heterosexual relationship. It might seem like such a special snowflake argument, but let's come down and think about it, okay? I told you that when I realized that Cassandra is the canonical protagonist of the story, it reduced my enjoyment from the game, right? So I can imagine the disappointment and anger of a person who made a specific romantic choices, then being forced into this relationship and even having a kid with a partner. Writers tried later to fix the story by adding new choice lines, referring to the relationship as a, not an emotional connection but more of a way of securing legacy of the bloodline. It's like a speed interface, really bad writing. Anyways, that's the controversy. And the fact that Cassandra is the canonical eagle bearer makes it even harder to pull off. In her story, Darius has a son, Natakas, with whom she has a child. As a woman, she would have been forced to take a long break from being a Mystios. So to see her jumping from roofs, fighting and sprinting so soon after giving birth shatters an semblance of realism. The second episode of the DLC ends with happy family and a distant threat of Amorges finally reaching onto his enemies. Which plays out exactly the way you would have suspected in the last episode. Amorges ambushes Darius, Nima and Elpidios while Alexios is away. Artabanus, Alexios. Eagle Bearer doesn't make it in time to save Nima. Please, don't. Please, don't leave me behind. Alpidius is abducted by the Order of the Ancients. 
Darius and Alexios, grieving after the loss of Nima, jump at each other's throats, but are forced to work together in order to save Igilberer's son and finally put an end to Amorges. Who said I survived? Their search brings them to Messenia, the base of operations for the Order. So, again, Alexis has to sabotage Amorges' operation in the region to draw him out. When everything is ready, Darius and Alexis face Amorges. Where is Elpidios? Where is my son? Far from war, far from danger, far from you. I once swore to the people I love that I would crush the Order. Believe me, I will keep that promise. With you, he'll never be safe. He is my son! Do you remember the truth I whispered in the ear of King Xerxes? Remind me, old friend. With all the Order's power, they could not protect you. Not from me. Ah! Dying Amorges reveals the location where Elpidios is being held. Alexios rushes to recover his son. Alexios has to make a difficult decision. He realizes that his son will never be safe with him. He entrusts Elpidios safety to Darius. I must admit, I really like this story. It makes Alexius finally seem humane. There are so many things at stake for him, and the DLC makes the whole thing condensed enough to feel important. The story ends with Darius taking his grandson to Egypt. It is revealed then that Elpidios is an ancestor to Aya, the wife of Bayek of Siwa a pair who created the Hidden Ones, which is a precursor organization to the Assassin's Brotherhood. Should a day come where he feels unloved or alone, you tell him there is no such day, because he will always be loved. You hear me? You will always be loved. You'll fight, and you'll fall. There will be times when you'll think you can't rise again. You'll want to stay down, but you will get up, Elpidios. Because you're strong. Because our bloodline is strong. And because we always get up. You'll ask why. And while you'll never know me, know this. You are my son, and I will always fight for you. You, and those that will come after. The second DLC story is a mess. First of all, everything Alexis does in the Animus is fictional. Each realm he enters turns out to be fake. It's a simulation designed to test Igilberer, but most importantly to test Laila Hassan. So, Elysium, Underworld and then finally Atlantis are not real. Those are simulations of presumably past Isu territories. They are filled with projections of some true Isu beings mixed with memories of Alexios' companions. There is a great feeling of a fan fiction quality in storytelling once player discovers what's really happening. So I'm actually not going to explore this story as it doesn't matter that much. What matters is the exploration of Isu lore, especially on Atlantis. We presume that the lore is real, so it builds upon what we, 
players know about precursors. It explains the artifacts hidden within mythic beasts. It talks about Poseidon's rule, Juno and her betrayal. The modern day story is also a mess. Leila attempts the trials in Animus under the watchful eye of Aletheia. The simulations are there for Leila to master the stuff given to her by Alexios. At the same time, her associate and doctor Victoria manages to reach Leila in order to monitor her health. Leila tends to get more aggressive and violent as she uses the Animus, and when Victoria forcefully pulls her off the device, Leila strikes and kills her. This prompts the Isu construct, Alithia, to reconsider whether Leila is even worthy of attempting the trials. There are so many problems with the writing. Let's start. Abstergo discovers where Leila is hiding. They send four highly trained soldiers to face her. Only that, they do not have any equipment. Just clubs, no guns, tasers, sleeping darts, anything. It's just baffling. Then Leila kills Victoria. Immediately she focuses on pressuring Alithia to get back into Animus and doesn't care about the corpse of her supposed friend laying next to her. Then she finally enters the device and the corpse is still there. Then we have this questionable behavior of Alithia who is a construct. Some sort of an AI to be honest? And this AI even allows Leila to quarrel? Try to argue with your computer and see what happens. I mean, I guess Alithia can be some sort of an advanced program with cognitive functions, but still, I doubt that she should be persuaded so fast. Okay, and the last thing. After everything gets concluded, Otso Berg comes down alone to confront Leila. At least he has a gun. Still, it doesn't matter as Leila defeats him and impales him with her staff. Then he lays down on the floor in water. And you know, water makes you bleed out really fast. So even if he is wounded and not dead, then he should die pretty fast. But I have this feeling that we will see Otso Berg in the next games which, to be honest, will make me rage. The guy was impaled through the gut and left in the water bleeding for god knows how long. Altair 2, come in! Atlantis has been compromised. I like Alithia? Alithia! Your earpiece. Can anyone hear me? Anyways, Leila contacts her group through Victoria's earpiece and the story concludes. First we lost everyone's vitals and Elena. then... It's me. Ancient Greece is a world full of wonders. Tall mountains, volcanic wastelands, dry sunburned steppes, pirate coves, uncharted islands, mysterious caves. The game world is vibrant and eye-catching, offering a lot of diversity. This is the same game engine which was used in Origins. And that game impressed me not only with its visuals, but also with a great attention to details in its environments and world building. The world of Odyssey, while still beautiful and invigorated with colors, felt less polished. Maybe it's the case of me playing Origins first, so the engine doesn't impress me that much. Maybe it's because it is much easier to create detailed world when it's more condensed. A lot of Origins playing fields were deserts, but I would lie to you if I hadn't admitted that I loved exploring all those barren sand dunes. Previous entry in the franchise just sold the experience of traveling through harsh sand wastelands in a really immersive way. It also led designers to focus on cities, Nile Delta and places which stood out. Odyssey offers some impressive landscape visuals. The game shines when presenting views of distant forts or cities during nighttime, engulfed by the lights of torches and braziers. Traveling through endless meadows and plains can feel relaxing. Part of the spectacle created by the graphics engine is in its handling of sunlight and shadows. Exploring the world can be both immersive and impressive. Odyssey fares better when you look at it from the macro perspective. But when you approach it looking really close at the environmental details, then I think that Origins did it a little bit better. The level of details on different kinds of armor sets and weapons is impressive though. They look so good. Unfortunately, not everything is so praiseworthy. As this is a really huge world, it's impossible for the developers to catch every texture glitching or not meshing well with other surfaces. That's definitely a case in here. Also, in addition to that, the rain effect just looks so cheap. You're my daughter, Phil. I should never have 
lost your way. I have always been so... Main characters voice actors did a fantastic job. Melisanti Mahoud voicing Cassandra delivered a praiseworthy performance. While most side characters are also really, really good, there are few who unfortunately drop the ball. Some lines just sound so fake and emotionless. It doesn't happen often, but when you encounter it, then it's noticeable. Who do you think I am, Alexios? Some say I show great wisdom. Others say I am wisdom herself. The Scylla will blow you out of the water. Her fleet will crush you! <laughs> There is also a problem of too few child actors. I had a feeling like there was only one actor voicing boys and one actress voicing girls. My drug me. Give it back. Here, please don't hurt me. They made me do it. I didn't want to. Honest. <laughs> Sound mixing during conversation has a tendency of being a little bit off. Sometimes when you talk to somebody, all of a sudden, one of their lines is much louder. There's also this problem of sudden tone changes in the middle of conversations. It's so weird. Then you sent me to a pirate in need, who asked me to help him as he saw fit. Was that a divine test of wisdom? Or just practicality? You sent yourself to a pirate. I merely provided the chance. Finally, that strange hermit with the key. He was even under a statue of Athena's icon, the owl. Music in Odyssey defends itself really well. Different soundtracks created for various regions help in adding much needed distinction in this vast world. Combat tracks are solid. I wouldn't call them memorable, but they fit within the general atmosphere of the game. Odyssey offers its own version of Ezio's family, which right now is an anthem for the franchise. It's good. A very fitting spin of Jasper Kid's masterpiece. Look at this view. Not only is it madly impressive, but also helps to enforce the scale of Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Everything you see is explorable. Now that's breathtaking. Or at least it should be until you realize that the exploration uses a very pattern-based model. A lot of activities in the game are repetitive. You see, Odyssey's world is huge, and I'm the last person to berate large gaming worlds. On the contrary, I encourage them. There is this exhilarating feeling when you see a huge new world opening before your eyes in game. World full of mysteries. And here we have the problem. Ubisoft open world design strips its words of their secrets as it shows you exact locations of every point of interest and then presents you with their checklist of major things to do in order to complete the location. It's been like that for a long time with Ubisoft open world games. Nonetheless, it slowly turns the whole aspect of exploration into mundane, predictable and, most importantly, boring chore. Which is a major crime when you operate around the game world this huge and beautiful. You see, I actually liked playing Assassin's Creed games and slowly complete them up. It felt therapeutic and relaxing. To switch off your brain and slowly fill the checklist of activities on the map, it most certainly wasn't ambitious, but it was fun. Assassin's Creed Odyssey taught me that there is a limit, a boundary after which it gets too tedious. For me, it's between 50 to 70 hour mark. After that, unfortunately, the system gets tiring. This kind of exploration system is very popular in open world games nowadays. It guides players so they won't miss on any interesting place in the world. At the same time, it actually kills the feeling of mystery, the sense of wonder, it kills exploration and transforms it into sightseeing. Some notable examples of similar systems in other games could be Witcher 3 or Horizon Zero Dawn. Both great games. I actually consider the exploration in the third Witcher game to be its most disappointing element. What's interesting, developers of Horizon actually put some effort in their world traversing systems. The marks of various mechanical beasts' lairs help players to find those and it's an integral element of the gameplay loop as you need parts of specific creatures in order to upgrade your gear. 
tall necks wandering in zone were used as a lookout towers. Then there were cauldrons, bases hiding powerful upgrades, similar in design, but each one of them had its own layout, which actually mattered during exploration. It made them memorable. Now, in Odyssey, we have those impressive, monumental fortresses. Unfortunately, they all blend with each other as player does the exact same thing in every stronghold. So their layout can be different, they can look so majestic, but in the end, they all play the same. Bah! After some time, players are going to realize that some campsites are literally copy-pasted all over the world. The world of Assassin's Creed Odyssey begs for some features which would differentiate its locations from each other. Like maybe some quests specific to each stronghold. There could be a prison segment hidden beneath a castle floors, where players would be forced to sneakily rescue prisoners. Hell, use your impressive fire spreading feature and give players an adrenaline pumping crazy escape sequence from burning fortress. Set up a hidden puzzle sequence. Do something to make those beautiful places interesting and worthwhile. Those shouldn't be treated as yet another mark on the map. They should feel significant. So yeah, I have a big problem with the exploration in this game. It just feels like such a wasted potential. The formulaic approach of Ubisoft turns the great ancient Greece into the map of check marks, which offer another list of check marks in order to be considered as complete. The open world element adds a variety of ways in which players can travel and approach each location. That's an advantage, sure. Raiding force at night reduces players' chances of being spotted. It's great. But how many times can you do the same thing over and over again? And the rewards are rarely worth it, as you could get similar amount of resources by doing something else. So after a while, the world starts to feel bland. It's tragic. How dare you create such a huge, visually impressive world and fail so miserably to make it interesting gameplay-wise. I'm sorry, I'm getting heated, but it's such a waste. There was a glimpse of hope when I started my adventure with the game. I was asked whether I want to use a guided mode or exploration mode when I play. The realistic difference is that guided mode shows you exactly where you have to go on the map, while in exploration mode, player gets some hints and needs to figure out where they should go. Now, let's talk about the exploration formula in direct relation to the gameplay. The land masses of the old Greek kingdoms are divided into regions. Each region has a level range assigned to it. So it's a clue for players that the quests and enemies in that zone are designed to be accessible from certain level upwards. And Ubisoft made it so trying to tackle enemies which are 4 5 level higher is a daunting, unreliable experience. So we have this artificial grid on the map suggesting the order in which you should tackle the zones. Of course, if you are a completionist like me, then you will outlevel the order of the zones pretty fast. But then what? Another mechanic kicks in. In Odyssey, Ubisoft decided to create this system of content, enemies, equipment, tasks, leveling up with the player, a level scaling. I know what the goal is. To keep the content relevant to the player no matter where they go. Sure, seems enticing, but it completely kills the sense of progression. Players doesn't feel like they are getting stronger since every enemy levels up with them. Sure, there are settings allowing players to increase the gap in level scaling, but the max range of the gap is only 4 levels wide. This is also the major reason why I decided to switch from the hardest difficulty level to hard difficulty, as nightmare difficulty forced level scaling of every enemy directly to my level, which I did not enjoy. I want to feel like I can progress and over level some content. I should be the legendary hero, able to squash mere mortals and not be constantly beaten to death by unarmored bandits. I never liked this system. Sure, I can understand it. I can tolerate it. But my favorite go-to example in terms of gating exploration are the first two gothic games. In there, you had enemies who were used as roadblocks. At first, a lone wolf would be a challenge to the player. But then, with time, as player would overlevel said wolf, they would realize that they can take on pack of wolves, then maybe even stronger enemies. Player realistically moved up inside the in-game chain of opponents, which felt like an actual progression. The same could be said about Horizon Zero Dawn. Let's take the Scrapper, one of the first mechanical beasts we will encounter. It has a set power. Every Scrapper is level 8. 
There are some variations later on, but they at least have a distinctive visual changes to them. Aloy will struggle while fighting a single scrapper, then she will outlevel those enemies and will be able to take a pack of scrappers. This is the same principle as there is in Gothic. Player knows that they are moving up in the threat chain. At the highest level, players are the greatest threat in the game and it feels satisfying. In Odyssey, the same wolf which we killed at level 5 in Kefalonia will all of the sudden become level 45 in other zone. No change in behavior or visuals, just inflated HP and damage. I do not appreciate it. But as more and more games use this model of open world design, I kinda learned to deal with it. And here I want to tell you an interesting story. You see, I'm very passionate about games and from time to time my wife asks me what I'm playing right now and what do I think about the game that I'm playing. I told her about my gripes with Odyssey and its exploration system and she disagreed. She is more of a casual gamer, but she told me that she actually enjoyed the Witcher 3 exploration system as it made her feel like she is not going to miss anything on the map. It was a problem for her in Skyrim which had this huge world but players had to explore it on their own. Markers on the map appeared only when player was close to certain location, which felt for me like I was actually discovering the land on my own. For my wife it felt stressful as she constantly thought that she missed everything around her when she committed to a certain path or direction. What I'm getting at are different points of view. I do not favor Ubisoft's style of open world design, but there are people who adore it. Neither mine nor their opinions are invalid. People have different tastes. So if you disagree with me on anything, I say write it down in the comments. And as I said before, there will be people who will enjoy this model of exploration. I'm simply stating why it stopped working for me. Now, some people might want to defend Ubisoft by saying that I can turn off all the hints and informations in the settings tab. Sure, I can do that. Ubisoft is really efficient with creating a lot of settings and sliders in order to present much choice for players. Player can reduce and hide various tips appearing on screen. They can effectively hide every element of HUD and create a more cinematic and more immersive experience. And that's great. It's a commendable approach by the developers but problems with exploration are rooted much deeper. Default version of the game is designed with all the hard elements available. Icarus is designed to be the lookout for the player, a device to highlight certain points of interest on the map, to show various objectives in each location. Then there is the design of the world. Each cave works almost the same. It's cool that all of them look differently and present various layouts, but in order to count them as completed, players usually have to loot certain chests and sometimes maybe kill a specific enemy. You can hide the checklist, but as soon as player figures out the formula, the magic vanishes. And as I said before, there will be people who will enjoy this model of exploration. I'm simply stating why it stopped working for me. Look at this cave. If it would be in Skyrim or a game with different exploration model, finding it would be extremely exciting. In Assassin's Creed, as soon as I reveal its symbol on the minimap, I know what to expect. Ah, it's another one of those caves with three chests and a couple of enemies to kill. And in most cases, there isn't anything meaningful there to differentiate this cavern from others. To close off the exploration segment, let me say that I believe that there is enough room in game dev for different approaches to open world design. Some Ubisoft developers might disagree with me, as they were quick to condemn Elden Ring design when the game launched, but this is a creative medium. For an industry taking such a great pride in diversity, it's time to realize that there is more than one approach to creating vast, enchanting worlds. It should be embraced. I didn't like how Ubisoft wasted such an interesting potential of ancient Greece, but I still believe that this kind of design fits a little bit smaller, more condensed games. Or maybe it's time to put more effort and evolve your huge worlds in order to make them more engaging.
AC Origins significantly changed the combat formula for the franchise. It added some well-deserved freshness into the mix. Odyssey continues this trend, builds upon it and upgrades its various elements. Eagle Bearer can use various types of weapons. Each weapon type has specific set of animations. Two-handed maces and axes offer stronger but slower attacks. Spears excel at thrusting at enemies from the safe distance, while double daggers are designed for fast attacks in close combat scenarios. Then there are bows which let player pick up enemies from greater range. Our protagonist does not use a hidden blade. Assassinations are performed with the broken spear of Leonidas, a symbol of Alexis's heritage. Combat options are enhanced through abilities. Each level grants a single skill point which can be spent in the abilities tab. There are three separate divisions here. Hunter skills focus on ranged combat. Player is able to master a predator shot, which can be remotely controlled. They can choose to obtain spread shot. Ability automatically locks three random enemy targets in range and shoots them for 100% hunter damage. On higher levels, it can lock even more targets at the same time. Higher in this section, you can find an ability to shoot through walls or the overpowered bow strike, a mighty explosive shot dealing massive amounts of damage. Other divisions focus on assassin and warrior abilities. Players can find some passive skills in the tab, but most nodes represent active abilities. Players can learn to perform characteristic This is Sparta kick. They can charge through enemies, perform assassinations from greater lands or poison their weapons. As I said before, Odyssey embraces a more liberal fantasy approach to the series. Numerous abilities represent supernatural feats of strength. Yes, it enriches the experience, allows for more options, but I liked it more when Assassin's Creed was rooted within its historical realities a little bit stronger. Odyssey introduces three new major damage types. They do coincide with the three skill divisions, so we have Hunter, Assassin and Warrior damage. Outside of specific skills, they are assigned to bow shots, Hunter damage, Assassinations, Assassin damage and melee weapon blows, Warrior damage. Each piece of equipment has certain stats assigned to it and also increases at least one damage type. And here we dive into build making. Yay! Okay, so if you watched any of my previous videos, then you should already know that I greatly appreciated the depth of gameplay mechanics and by extension of that, the option to create uh, various meaningful builds for your character. AC Odyssey allows its players to have fun with directing their Eagle Bearer. Ubisoft gives you tools in form of different skills and weapon types, allows you to mix them up into your liking and then gives you various equipment pieces to strengthen your playstyle. The game introduces even armor sets with certain distinct bonuses, so the itemization feels meaningful. I choose to pursue Hunter Damage build as I just like to snipe enemies from afar. So I pursued Artemis set and Athenian War Hero set as both of them increased Hunter damage with the difference being that Artemis bonus increases damage of skills based on Hunter damage greatly and Athenian War Hero armor increases overall Hunter damage by a lower amount but also makes your arrows deal percentage of their damage even through enemy shields. AC Odyssey offers decent itemization. Doesn't matter though. As fun as it is, on easier difficulties it won't matter that much. You can mow down enemies without problem either way. On harder difficulties it's beneficial to specialize in one type of damage in order to deal with enemies effectively. This is where build making and conscious decisions come into play. The three different approaches to combat signify the change within design of the game. Stronger RPG elements give players options but take away the franchise heritage. Origins started this trend of reducing crowd sizes. It foregone hidden among common people on the streets. There are no longer options to pay courtesans to distract guards, hire some goons to do the dirty work. Parkour was significantly facilitated. Odyssey doubles down on that design choice. Stealth is merely an option here, not the major focus of the experience. It's still entertaining to slowly assassinate your way through fortresses defenders, but the RPG elements might actually disrupt the gameplay. 
You see, assassinating the target uses assassin damage. So if your character does not specialize in that type of damage, then it might turn out that you won't be able to one-shot stronger enemies during stealth. And there is always an option to just hack and slash your way through enemies, especially if you choose to focus on warrior damage. With diminished stealth, lack of hidden blade and more action RPG focused gameplay, is it still an Assassin's Creed game? It seems like Mercenary's Code should be more fitting title. Depending on the difficulty, it's sometimes possible to take on the whole garrison of enemies, which excludes another prominent feature of this franchise. Chases. There are almost no fronting chase sequences known from previous Assassin's Creed games, no rooftop runs. Unequivocally, the series has evolved, but it lost some of its most fun characteristic elements. With the lack of chases comes the simplified parkour. Right now, it's mostly a tool used for free, unlimited exploration. By pushing a single button, our character will start to climb walls or will jump through obstacles. Very rarely, player might find an unscalable piece of rock formation or a wall. So thanks to this decision, parkour is much easier. It feels more fluent and natural to use. Unfortunately, there is a drawback. Parkour loses on engagement factor it once required from the player. Let's remind ourselves of some of the highest towers in first Assassin's Creed games. Getting there was an environmental puzzle of its own. Player had to figure out a way to get out to the top. There was a decision making within climbing. Sometimes you had to first scout every side of the building in order to plan your next step. It was occasionally tedious, but it undeniably was more engaging than what we have right now. In the second Odyssey's DLC, when we get to Atlantis, there is actually a small reminder of the past as some surfaces cannot be climbed, so players have to look for scalable elements. It's breeze of fresh air and reminder of the past. I enjoyed it. Enemy types in the game fall into the same categories of foes which we had encountered earlier in the series. Standard soldier, archer, fast nimble rogue type, huge brute, brute with shield. They offer very little nuances, even when they are recolored based on which faction they serve. You know, bandits, cold, Sparta or Athens. As a basis for the foes encountered during combat, they work fine. Players should take into account if they fight against a shield guy or a fast opponent able to parry and counterattack. So it works fine. Combat becomes really interesting when you add mercenaries to the mix. Ubisoft introduced their own version of Nemesis system from Shadow of Mordor games. Mercenaries are randomly generated strong opponents. Each one of them has some weaknesses and strengths. Odyssey introduced this whole ranking system for mercenaries, which actually is just another progression mechanic for Eagle Bearer. Killing a mercenary above you on the ladder makes you go further up. Advancing to higher segments on the mercenary tab comes with specific boons. So there is an incentive and a reward in doing so. It's an interesting additional way of progressing your character. AC Odyssey adds another system on top of that. Attacking guards in forts and cities, as well as committing crimes, increases bounty on your head. Bounty decreases slowly over time. It can be paid off or you can kill people responsible for increasing it. The thing is that if Alexius accumulates high enough bounty on his head, then he is going to be chased by various mercenaries. It is possible to engage in a fight with a couple of those powerful enemies at the same time. Usually it's best to run away from that situation. Mercenaries could be treated as mini-bosses of this game. They draw from the same source of special abilities being also available for us. So, they can charge, kick, use special attacks, Usually, they specialize in one or two tricks, but it makes fights against them all the more interesting. Those battles evolve into deathly dances when you wait for the best time to counter the enemy. You have to dodge bombs or bow shots. Players should anticipate an unblockable attack signaled by the enemy turning red. Then, after that, it's time to strike. Fights against other mercenaries are done very well. After 50 hours, they can get monotonous, but still should not be ignored. The possibility of raising your bounty meter too high creates an incentive for players to focus more on stealth, so it's a nice addition. Assassin's Creed Odyssey finally increases the scope when it comes to boss fights. This franchise never paid much attention to this aspect of gaming DNA. 
let me remind you of Ezio Fist fighting Pope in AC2. Odyssey offers the best boss fights in the entire franchise, not counting Valhalla as I still haven't played the game. Bosses of the arena offer more environmental hazards while using similar move pool as mercenaries. There are a couple of bosses which players will face during the main story. Then there are the legendary beasts known from myths. This allows developers to flex their muscles not only in the pure visual aspect of the fight, but also in terms of the abilities used by the mighty foes. Bosses of Odyssey telegraph their attacks really well. They give you a chance to recognize and learn their movesets. Which is pretty standard boss design nowadays, but for this franchise it's pretty new. Eagle Bearer chases his goals not only by foot or on horseback. Alexios commands the mighty Adrestia, a powerful ship and her crew. So Ubisoft gives players yet another tab in the menu. This one is used for commanding Adrestia, upgrading her, changing colors and various cosmetic stuff, as well as choosing our lieutenants. We can recruit various characters into our crew and later use them as lieutenants. They will take part in naval battles, but most importantly, each one of them offers various buffs to our ship. Commanding Adrestia is very similar to selling Jagdo from Black Flag or Morrigan from AC Rogue, albeit a little bit simplified. We do not use cannons, instead we fire arrows shot by archers. There is an option to use flame arrows which deal more damage and could build up damage over time effect. Think of it as a special attack available through paying an additional cost. Sailing aboard Adrestia and battling other ships is a welcome change of pace for when players get a little bit too tired by the mundane tasks offered by the on-foot exploration. Upgrading our ship quickly becomes quite expensive and draining on resources, giving player another incentive for exploring new lands and accumulating wealth in-game. There is one story-related feature that I haven't talked about. You see, Odyssey takes place during Peloponnesian War. Most zones in game are controlled by either Sparta or Athens, representing two warring factions. As a Mystios, Alexius can join whichever side he wants, for a worthy compensation, of course. You've got my sword, Spartan. Good. We'll need all the iron we can get. Send these Athenians to Hades! Each region shows a meter representing how strongly it's being controlled by a faction. By destroying war supplies, killing soldiers and commanders, player can weaken controlling factions claim on the land. Then the zone will get contested and battlefield will be assigned. Players can side with a faction of their choice during battle, Sparta or Athens. Winning battle for the faction of your choosing declares it as the new rulers of the region. Unfortunately, Assassin's Creed Odyssey reduces this feature into absolutely meaningless activity. There are no consequences of siding with one army over other. You can later help the other faction retake the land again. No one will ever question you on aiding the opposing faction. There is no overall balance of power. If one faction controls most of the map, it's never noted. This whole system is pointless. It's just a side activity without merit. Just a gameplay thing to spice things up. But it's a shame that Ubisoft haven't figured out how to ingrain it deeper into Odyssey's core experience. It's fair to say that Odyssey is quite a long game. As I specified before, a lot of its features slowly turn into mundane, tedious activities. In order to combat that feeling, Ubisoft offers a system of upgrades for your gear. In the same vein as upgrading Adrestia, in here it's mostly about dumping your excessive resources and gold. Upgrade costs quickly go up, but in return, player can tweak various statistics of their armor in a meaningful way. You can unlock and even strengthen various equipment and engravings in order to make them stronger. This system is designed mostly for perfectionists, but it can give players something extra to do, an extra goal. Now, when I reached level 50, the game caught its second breath and threw at me an extension of its leveling and mercenary systems. In order to make late game progression a little bit more engaging, Ubisoft expands ability tab by allowing players to allocate skill points into various new statistics. Every skill point translates into a percentage-based upgrade. 
after spending one point on certain stat, you might not feel the sudden change, but allocating 10 points into it will increase the prowess of your character. I like this kind of further character development opportunities. It's not a very engaging addition as it slowly builds Eagle Bearer the way you want, but still it gives you another incentive to keep playing and exploring. It offers an additional reward for continuous play. The same goes for further expanding a mercenary tab. The game adds another 4 levels of new, even stronger mercenaries. Advancing further up in the ladder of killers gives player another boons, another incentive to keep doing what you are doing. Unfortunately, in the end it doesn't matter how many systems borrowed from the other games Odyssey is going to use. The base gameplay loop mixed with wasted exploration potential cannot keep the game interesting for its full runtime, especially if player opts to complete various side quests. Odyssey runs on the same engine as AC Origins. While I had almost zero problems with Bayek's adventure, I noticed some issues during my time spent with Alexios. The biggest issue were reoccurring crashes. At least once per 5 hours spent inside Animus, I had experienced a screen freeze leading to a game crash. It's definitely not game breaking, but it is infuriating as it kept happening. Those crashes also corrupted my file if I was recording my gameplay. Other than that, there are some minor bugs and glitches. Pathing of NPCs sometimes breaks, enemy AI is easily abusable. On some occasions they don't even notice that you killed a friend of theirs in plain sight. In a game world of this size, visual glitches are bound to happen. From time to time, players may find floating rocks or trees, wall elements not fitting each other or textures glitching. Parkour works the same as it worked in the previous entry of the franchise, albeit this time there are more visual hiccups during our acrobatic run. Most of the ledges work properly when players try to cross them from multiple various angles, but from time to time, game freaks out and cuts an animation. Now, Ubisoft designers are proud of their UI and the plethora of options they give to the players. By default, UI is not bad. It offers a lot of free space for the players to immerse themselves within the story. On some occasions, the screen can get cluttered with too much information and useless pop-outs. Thankfully, the settings menu allows players to reduce the clutter. It's an invaluable addition. Does it justify the initial disorder that could happen on the screen? No, I don't think so. But the ability to transform the UI into your own taste is commendable. The same goes for other settings. Ubisoft is relentless in this department, as every single slider is described with care, so even oblivious players should know what they are doing. Controls work properly, I played the game on mouse and keyboard and there were no issues. Focusing on targets works fine, but after some time I preferred not to use lock-on mode and just fight freely. Before talking about paid DLCs, I must inform you that Ubisoft decided to be generous with their content offer. Assassin's Creed Odyssey got a lot of free narrative content released after launch. Ubisoft created numerous additional storylines and added two new high-level bosses. The storylines are surprisingly good. Each one of them takes about 1 to 2 hours to complete. They all tell cohesive, interesting stories of their own. The two new boss fights are fine. You can tell that those are just variations of the Cyclops fight, but each one of them adds new visuals and interesting rewards worth players time. Premium DLCs are both split into 3 episodes. Ubisoft committed to that move in order to artificially extend the experience a little bit so that the journey feels longer. Each episode was released separately, but since we are years after release, all of the content is already waiting for us. Another advantage to playing fully patched complete version of games. The first DLC, Legacy of the First Blade. This expansion focuses heavily on the narrative. Each of the episodes takes place in a different zone of the base game, so there is no new land added here. Episode 1 takes place in Macedonia, Episode 2 takes us to Achaia, with the whole story concluding in Messenia. The lack of new zones, features and questionable writing choices are the major reasons why this DLC is rated so low by the community. 
but I actually liked it. First episode offers a great visually impressive cutscenes and introduces a character of Darius, the first ever person to use a hidden blade. So it's a pretty major stepping stone in the lore of the franchise. Legacy of the First Blade explores the story of Darius and focuses on further developing the legacy of Eaglebearer's bloodline. It finally connects Odyssey with Origins in a meaningful way. Order of the Ancients makes an appearance. In similar fashion to the Cold of Cosmos, they can be haunted by the player. It's such a shame that the storyline proves again that Ubisoft writers do not know how to give players narrative choices and agency over the course of the story. It would work better as a linear experience. Still, the conclusion to the main narrative felt satisfying. The second DLC, The Fate of Atlantis, follows the steps of the second Origins DLC, Curse of the Pharaoh. It focuses mostly on the fantasy elements of Greek mythology. Each of the three episodes offers a new, quite big, visually impressive zone. The visuals here are definitely an absolute highlight. Eagle Bearer visits a soothingly beautiful and calm Elysium, a legendary land of prosperity, vast colorful plains and picturesque mountains. But behind the veil of beauty there is unhappiness, inequality and trickery. Then players will explore the underworld ruled by Hades. After which Eagle Bearer will finally arrive in the titular Atlantis. I have to say that each one of the three episodes feels like its own expansion. In the underworld we are given this new type of fallen characters which you have to hunt, there are those new teleporting devices. In Atlantis players unlock ability to enhance their skills in order to drastically change their effects. This DLC offers a solid story, a lot of varied content with magnificent visual art style and it finally moves the overall modern day plot forward. Unfortunately when it comes to Lila's personal story the quality of writing is very poor. I find it funny that the biggest advancements in the overarching narrative of Assassin's Creed franchise are not done in the base game, they are done in the DLCs. First expansion connected the narrative with Ancient Egypt, told us about the first user of Hidden Blade and explained how Aya got the technology in Origins. Second DLC goes really hard on exploring the lore around Issue civilization, finally lifts the veil of mystery from the precursors and further develops the modern day story of Lila. Base game did only one thing that matters for the grand plot of the franchise, which is the event of Lila receiving a gift. And I'm deliberately being vague here in order not to spoil anything for people who skipped spoiler section and want to experience everything on their own. This is the part where I'm going to check the most recent 100, maybe 200 Steam reviews. I'm curious what other players think about the game and I want to compare their opinions with mine. If I disagree with someone, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person is wrong. People can have disagreements, it's fine, what I care about is argumentation. If you have strong arguments in defending your position, then I am willing to reconsider my position. At the time of making this video the game sits at a score of 89% positive reviews out of 115,000 total reviews. We can already see that the game is very popular, so Ubisoft's strategy worked, the game sold well. As you probably had already noticed, I've got some problems with the game. Yet whenever I see any poll on the internet regarding the last three Assassin's Creed games, it's usually Odyssey at the first place while Origins is usually placed at the last one. I really want to know why is that? Why people like this game so much? Is it just because of the world, setting, characters? The majority of the positive reviews praise the game based on its huge, vibrant, colorful world and massive amount of activities. A great deal of players also took a liking to the main story with Cassandra being praised as the best character in the whole game. And I am specifically talking about reviewers who spent at least 100 hours within the game. Here, this reviewer claims that AC Odyssey is their first Assassin's Creed game. This person comments the open world and freedom in exploration while pointing out that some quests are very one-dimensional. They recognize the anticlimactic ending to the story and I absolutely agree with that statement. This player liked the fantasy elements of the game praising especially the boss battles against mythical creatures. 
I told you those boss fights are finally good. This review is a great look at people who started their adventure with Odyssey. It perfectly shows that previous experiences matter. If this would be my first game of this series, I would definitely be more forgiving towards it. But I played all the previous games of the franchise. While it's up to Ubisoft to decide however the hell they wish to develop their games, I'm entitled to my opinion. I like that they try new things, I'm just not sure if we really need to sacrifice so much from the past iterations of the franchise. It's apparent that many people spend countless hours in the game's world having fun. Even the fans of older games find Odyssey deeply immersive and interesting. So apparently, this huge world with great amount of content works for most players. Yes, some people voice their dissatisfaction with the game turning out to be a little bit generic or repetitive, but still, they are in the minority. It seems like beautiful world of great scale set in a vibrant location can go a long way. What about negative opinions? Most reviews point out two things. It's either problems with launching the game or repetitive content. The good thing is that reviews pointing out performance issues are getting responses from developers, so they do care about their players. Among the negative opinions, there are also people who lacked previous iterations of the game. This reviewer acknowledges that changes and innovations are welcomed, but the game itself strayed too far from the source material. There is an undeniable merit to that. Whether it's a good or bad thing, it's up for you to decide. Let's close this section with this particular review. This person states the same positives as we have seen before. They claim to like freely roaming the world, explore it while getting stronger. Only that, the level scaling system actually works against the player, because if you level up without upgrading your gear, then the enemies actually become stronger. It's a problem and I'm glad that someone else also noticed it. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is definitely a decent game. High production quality and quantity of content few other titles can match. But does it warrant such a high praise from the community? Shouldn't we require more ambition in designing those AAA blockbusters? In a true Odyssey Socrates fashion, I'm not gonna answer the question. I will just leave you with it. Assassin's Creed Odyssey contains a total of 93 achievements. The game is extremely big and overly long, so in order to fully complete it, players need to spend a considerable amount of time in ancient Greece. Not only that, in order to get 100% completion, players need to play both paid DLCs and a pack of free DLC missions. Thankfully, those are the only restrictions as the game does not contain unmissable achievements or trophies tied to difficulty. Players can complete every challenge on a single playthrough. This is my favorite kind of achievement structure in games. You can approach every trophy on your own pace without having to worry about voiding or skipping any of them. Every player should be able to climb a sizable portion of achievements just by playing casually. Odyssey awards trophies for unlocking a certain stages of story progression as well as character progression, reaching certain character level, unlocking new skills, acquiring legendary items are pretty straightforward and most players are going to complete those tasks either way in their playthroughs. Then there is a set of trophies tied to specific quest lines. Those will require to explore the world a little bit. Achievements like Mistius in Training and Island Hopper will require to complete some repeatable content like bounties and contracts. Small tip, focus on Island Hopper first, complete all quests on Pefka, Obsidian and Abantis Islands and then finish it up with a couple of tasks from the message board. It will increase your progress in both achievements. Exploring Ancient Greece rewards players with two separate achievements. Both require a decent amount of time spent in game in order to be acquired. Hermes Homie tasks player to unveil every sub-region in Greece, which effectively means visiting every region. Player does not have to interact with the question marks on the map, just unveil every part of the map. Then there is Child of Poseidon. This one requires to complete every underwater location. Here players have to show some dedication. A side note. There's one or two of those locations hidden in the middle of the open seas. Both of them are a part of some side quests, but if you don't want to hunt for every side mission, finding those hidden underwater locations might be daunting. 
And now we are left with some random achievements. Players are challenged to spend the night with other character, perform an overpower attack with every weapon type, crew their ship with a set of legendary companions or to defeat every member of the Cult of Cosmos, a task that will again require a sizable amount of time. I want to highlight two achievements in this section. First, Stinky Eye. On Kefalonia, the introductory zone, players clash with a man called as the Cyclops. Our protagonist will hide a valuable of Cyclops in the rear end of a random goat. This achievement asks for player to return to that zone and kill goats until the item is retrieved. Wrath of Amazons asks to cleave enemy ship in half while having an all-woman crew. So equip Adrestia with women lieutenants as well as the woman only crew variant and go for hunt. DLC achievements. Let's start with free content. Ubisoft added multiple quest lines post release as well as two new boss encounters. After progressing far enough in the game, all of those additions unlocked to the player. It's hard to miss them because they are clearly marked on the map and in the quest log. Completing each encounter and each short storyline rewards players with a separate achievement. Legacy of the First Blade DLC adds new achievements to the game. Progressing through each one of its three episodes awards a trophy. Killing every member of the Order in Macedonia, Ahia and Messenia is also rewarded. This DLC adds achievements tied to the new skills it brought to the game. If you, like me, own a complete edition from the start, you might not realize that some of the abilities in the skill tree were added to the game after its release. Players will get separate trophies for killing 10 enemies with each of the new abilities. Then there are a couple of achievements tied to using new legendary weapons which enhance some other skills. Fate of Atlantis focuses more on exploration of each new zone it adds. Of course, story progression is rewarded with achievements, but the majority of trophies are connected to exploring the map and completing specific points of interest on the map. So, completionists, if you want to max out the game and explore its world to the fullest, Get ready to spend at least 100 hours in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. While getting 100% filled me with this sick and twisted sense of pride and accomplishment, I do not believe that Odyssey is able to support more than 100 hours of gameplay and continuously make it fun. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is a tough game to score. I reviewed this title from a completionist point of view. I did the same thing with previous entries into the franchise and I actually enjoyed what Ubisoft did in Origins. Odyssey upgrades and builds upon almost every element it takes from AC Origins. Combat is fluent, offers a lot of choices in weaponry but also in picking and mixing different skills. Itemization allows for playing with various builds and supports crafting the Eagle Bearer suited for your playstyle. Ancient Greece is a beautiful, huge world with plethora of things to do. Various side quests, enemy forts, camps, caves, puzzles, Peloponnesian War presents an interesting time period to explore. There are a lot of various gameplay systems designed to engage players in different ways. The rivalry amongst mercenaries, the naval combat, build making supported by various armor sets and the hunt for the members of the Cult of Cosmos, a new shadowy organization. Ubisoft did a decent job at supporting the game post-launch with some nice storylines and even additional boss fights. First DLC focuses strongly on story, connecting Odyssey to the rest of the franchise. It lacks some flashy new content, but the plot is decent. The second DLC offers a marvelous spectacle based strongly around Greek mythology. It also explores the lore of the Isu race. Both of the petty DLCs are a worthy additions to the game, especially if you get them together at sale. So, what's the problem? Every feature in game is being overstretched to accommodate for how huge the world is. It results in a title where most of its various elements slowly become tedious and boring. A feeling ever present in the previous Assassin's Creed titles, yet it's Odyssey that finally managed to defeat me with its reliance on the copy-paste content. Inherently, it's not bad, but it is disappointing. It feels like Ubisoft's only ambition was to create a huge world which would cater to the biggest player base. And they succeeded. Plenty of players enjoyed this game. 
I feel like there is hollowness hidden behind the content. The plot starts strong, but as all other things, gets lost in the vastness of the world. It ends up being just okay, with some emotional hooks which fail to land a satisfying end. The game also focuses more on the fantasy elements, which is not the direction that I enjoy. The absolute cardinal sin of Assassin's Creed Odyssey is how Ubisoft managed to build such a vast, beautiful open world and later wasted its potential by filling it with formulaic similar content. Basically a checklist. It infuriates me. So, I can acknowledge that Assassin's Creed Odyssey is a decent product, with high production value. It offers a lot of content, but the whole game was a disappointment for me, especially taking into account Ubisoft's budget and capability. Steam asks me, would I recommend this game? And my answer is no, I will not. This is a decent game, but it's disappointing in too many crucial elements, at least in my opinion. I do not recommend this game. Hey, I want to thank all of you for watching this video. It took me an enormous amount of time to finish the game and then prepare the review. If you like it then hit thumbs up, subscribe and maybe leave a comment. If you didn't like it then feel free to dislike the video and I would also encourage you to write up in the comment section what you didn't enjoy. The question to you after this video is simple. What is your opinion about Assassin's Creed Odyssey? Are you okay with the direction this series is taking or would you prefer for it to stick closer to the roots of the franchise? So that's all from me, bye.